Mission First Tactical is a proud sponsor of the Talking Lead Podcast and the Leadhead Brigade. How are my levels? Do I need to do a check, 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 one, two? Yeah, give, give me some check, check, check. Okay, check, 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 check. One, two, three. Four score and seven years ago. So in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands to be connected with another. And to assume among the powers of the earth the separate but equal stations to which nature and nature's God entitle and a decent respect to the opinions of mankind require that they declare the causes which impel them to separation. Classical education here. I just I just wanted to get that recorded. <laughs> <laughs> that was impressive. You are a, a history major, though, right? American history. I am. That's, that's what I thought. I remember that. All right. Ah, you got your drink ready? Um, I do. All right, all right, all right, lead heads. It is time for another episode of the Talking Lead Podcast. I am your host, Lefty. And I hope my volume's okay. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you. You hear me good? Okay. I've had an issue uh, in previous recordings on this new system where it's not loud on that end. So hopefully um, I've fixed that issue this episode, Leadheads. And uh, we are back with another episode of the Talking Lead Podcast. Like I said, Leducating the Uneducated here on the show for the past... What is this? 2024? Since since 2012. How many years is that? Is that like 12 years? Something like that? That sounds like 12 years to me. <laughs> it usually adds up to that, doesn't it? <laughs> so, that voice that you hear, Leadheads, uh, it's been a minute since we've had this gentleman on the show, and we're glad to have him back. Uh, he is bringing in the new year strong with two new books that we're going to talk about. Ladies and gentlemen, it's author extraordinaire John Gilstrap. Good morning to you, or afternoon, I guess, here. Good morning, afternoon. You know, it's it's that 11 o'clock time here. I never know what to call 11. Is that noon or is that morning? Yeah. Well, here it's, it's I'm on the East Coast. You're in Texas, I guess, so we're... we're Close, I'm Tennessee. Literally, but... <laughs> you are in the morning and I am in the afternoon. It's, it's, it, it's like the space-time continuum has been fractured. Right, we're in the multiverse kind of deal. We're, we're space-time traveling here. Uh, but that, you know, that's the thing, 11... 11, I guess a.m. is still morning, so so really it's still morning. I consider it noon still, kind of early noon <laughs> kind of deal. But uh, nonetheless, John Gilstrap joined us all the way from, are you in West Virginia? West Virginia. West by God, Virginia. East <laughs> West by God, Virginia. Yeehaw, God's country up there. It really is God's country. We moved from the Washington, D.C. area about two years ago. and Oh, um, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I mean, I grew up there. My wife and I both grew up there, and it just—it's become something it never was before. I mean, it's politically obviously, but there's just to give you an idea. I moved to Berkeley County, West Virginia, so moving from Fairfax County, Virginia, uh -huh. where there was about 400 square miles of of land, you know, the county with 1.2 million people. Oh, wow. So I moved to Berkeley County, West Virginia, which is also about 400 square miles with 110,000 people. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, big it's a whole different world. Yeah, you guys aren't rubbing elbows and assholes there. Like, uh, Not a bit. Oh Not my a bit. gosh. So it's kind of got to be maybe a... How long were you in uh, Fairfax? Oh, I, it's, I went to elementary school there. So Oh, so pretty all, much, pretty much all life, your yeah. life. So, I mean, that's got to be like a big a big culture, not necessarily shock, but just difference in, in just people kind of deal. It is, you know, we decided, Same people. um, I don't, I write books for a living, right? So I don't have to commute anywhere. It doesn't make sense to be in, in an area that we don't like. And we found this patch of property out here. And I mean, unless you're one of those authors that likes to be, you know, in the, the background of what they're, they're writing about. But yeah. Well, it's not that far. Right. I mean, if I if I want to go there, it's it's an hour and a half to get you know back into the madness. But uh, it's just you know out here the the nights are dark and quiet. And, oh uh, man, I can imagine stars. Real stars. I mean, like real star fields, which you know I haven't seen in in years. That have always been minutes. there, but you just can't see them. Yeah. Yeah, it's all the light pollution. Yeah. So cool. We'll, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about your new house because you're in the process. The last time you were on the show show. In building um, 
uh, your your palace there. So we'll talk about that too. I'm, I'm <laughs> interested in hearing about that. Uh, but Leadheads, uh, as you're listening to this, go to John's website, which it's johngillstrap.com, J-O-H-N-G-I-L-S-T-R-A-P.com. And uh, there's more information about John there, his uh, two new books that he's got, and of course his his plethora of uh, previous novels that he's written as well, fiction and nonfiction. He's yes. Done, done a little bit of both there. Uh, but before we get into that, we want to thank our sponsors. We appreciate Mission First Tactical for making this episode possible. As you can see there, John, I've got one of their new drinky drinks. I call them drinky drinks. Uh, I think they call them thermoses or tumblers or something like that. Uh, but they've got a whole different line of of uh, like uh, explosive grade type drinks. And you you know about explosives. I, I do. And I'm curious if you tried to get that through TSA because I'm not sure it actually violates a rule. And I don't know what rule that it would. It's just a. Other than yeah. if I had liquid in it, then they they wouldn't let me have it, you know, because mm-hmm. it obviously uh, is over the what eight ounces or six ounces that they allow. All right, but if it's empty. Yeah, exactly. I have I have not tried this particular one. I have others that are less. Um, they're a little more discreet, less obvious than this one is. Um, but that's a good. I'm going to try that because if they take it, Actually, then it's in a just, perfect world. It's you free have advertising. it like in a backpack, so when you put it on the x-ray, it rolls out and rolls across the floor. <laughs> <laughs> right. And they all hit the dirt. It's like, ah. ah. <laughs> that would be great. Of course, I'd probably spend the night in jail, but oh well. Well, you know. Wouldn't be the first time. Uh, <laughs> but Miss First Tactical, check them out. Uh, MissFirstTactical.com. Use the code LEADHEAD. You're going to get 20% off. Uh, and then, of course, as you know, they're well known for their magazine or magazines and their holsters. I've got a magazine here. This is their new uh, Pro Series holster, John. It is um, a magnetic retention uh, holster. I don't know if you can see inside there or not, but it's got a little little magnet on the end of it that it's like 12 pounds of retention that holds your, your firearm in place. Uh, so you don't have all those uh, screws and washers and you know all that stuff to lose. So instead of the uh, the tension... Uh, that you have to put on it for the retention. It's just magnetic, so makes it really nice. And uh, it can get really compact with these, too. But this is their Pro Series. You guys can go get those there, too. In the waistband, out of the waistband. Mine's for a Glock 19, but you know they've got different uh, styles for different calibers, different models, different makes. And, John, we have these these magazines made up. I do a, another show. It's called The AK Corner each month, and we're – concentrate on eastern block firearms mostly the ak-47 uh, but we always do one every year it's the ak versus the ar and i had a special set of magazines made up from u.s palm and mission first tactical we got the gi joe versus cobra gi joe <laughs> real american hero <laughs> so but that's the cool thing about mission first tactical's magazines is you can get anything you want printed on there so you can get your covers your book covers Put on these magazines, John, and give those out at special promotions uh, when you're promoting. That is your, not a bad idea. That is a great idea, is what that is. <laughs> <laughs> and there's no other author doing that. And think what a hit you would be carrying these around Shot Show. You know, handing these out, say, yep. "Check out my new book." Bubbing, I can make the connection. Let me know. <laughs> All right, <laughs> we can make that happen. Um. But yeah, check out Mission First Tactical and of course Seal One for all your gun cleaning lubrication needs. Seal One and Done. They've got the aerosols. They've got the the liquids. And you can see I've been using mine. I went to the range this weekend, John. I've got some some guns I've been trying out. I took out a PM sixty three. Are you familiar with that, what that is? No. I wish I had it handy. I don't have it right. It's in the garage. I'll go get it and show it to you later. Um, but it's a Polish. Um, it was a fully automatic, but of course, you know, we can't have fully automatic here, so they converted it. Uh, but it's like a 19, I think the one I have is a 1968 or 1958 version of it. Took it out, ran it. It runs nine by 18 Makarov is, uh, hmm. the round that it shoots. So my issue was trying to find the ammo. So I finally found some ammo that was decently priced. Took it out, and it ran great. So we're going to talk about that on the upcoming AK Corner Leadhead, so make sure you tune in. Check that out. 
And I don't know if you can see it, but I've got some camo laying around the office here. There's some more behind me. That's going to be the next AK Corner topic, Leadheads. We'll be talking different uh, Russian camos, Eastern Bloc, communist, the enemy type camos. So tune in for that episode. Uh, so I think that's everybody I want to talk about right now as far as uh, sponsors. Of course, Whiskey River Beef. Uh, I'll give you guys the code for that. We got a new code for Whiskey River Beef. Got a beef sponsor, John. Well, good for you. Are you into into grilling out and, and eating meat? I am. In fact, one of I keep talking about this 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 place we moved to. There's a cattle farmer who lives across the road, but maybe a half mile from my house. So I bought a side of beef from him back last January, and um, almost done with it. There's a lot of ground beef that comes with the side of, side of beef. That's right. But, you can um, you can get a lot of beef out of those those cows. Of course, you know with Whiskey River, you let heads know we've had Prentice on. And he'll cut it any way you want. They've got a wide variety. You can get a whole cow. You can get a half cow. You can get a quarter cow. Uh, and then you can get all the the cuts that you want there in the ground beef. Um, so you know, it makes such a huge difference. Actually, I think having fresh beef. Um, it does. There's there's a different flavor to it. Yeah. Um, not you know not it's not like significantly different. It, and it some is. Some of it might be psychological, it, but it's. It's significantly different, especially with this, with Whiskey River Beef, because they, Whiskey Mash feed their beef from start to finish. And uh, he's down here in Tennessee, down close to Lynchburg, if you're familiar with Lynchburg, John. Sure. Uh, that's where Jack Daniels is, and uh, there's another uh, distillery. we got like three or four down there, uh, whiskey distilleries. But uh, it's, it's Whiskey Mash fed from Jack Daniels, um, Whiskey Mash. So it's it's got a very distinct flavor. I'll see if I can't get him to to send you some steaks. To try out. Does it have a like a like a whiskey tinge to it? It's just it's just got a it it's beef. I mean, it's no doubt beef. You definitely don't need to season or you know do anything like that. Um, just a little pepper, you know, a little salt as you're grilling it. But um, it's just got a distinct texture and and flavor to it. Yeah, it's really good. Huh. Yeah. So we'll we'll hook you up with that. We'll send you some. All right. Whiskey River Beef, farm to table with a twist. Come along with us on a quest towards achieving self-sufficiency in food production and fostering a robust local food source to promote good health. Stock up with premium Tennessee beef, unparalleled in flavor and tenderness. You can be confident that you're receiving beef with no added growth hormones or implants. Always pasture raised, locally USDA processed and shipped straight to your home. Whiskey River Beef is grass and whiskey mash fed and finished and is at least 14 days dry aged to enhance the tenderness and give you the most robust flavor imaginable. Go to whiskeyriverbeef.com today to order. Visit us on Instagram at Whiskey River Life and on Facebook at Whiskey River Beef LLC. Whiskey River Beef is a proud sponsor of the Talking Lead Podcast and the Leadhead Brigade. Uh, but Leadheads, uh, I hear something coming in. Uh, I think the gunny is on his way in, but we've got some jack wagons that we want to take care of. So, gunny, bring that train in. Hey, Ross, Zipper Pie, do or die, hold them high at eight and I. It is time for the Talking Lead Jack Wagon of the Week, so brace yourself, baby. So there it is. The train has stationed. Gunny came in hot this week. Uh, we're just going to get quick down and dirty with this. I don't really have any heroes, I was telling John, uh, but I do have a jack wagon that I want to take care of. And um, so I, I talked about this on a previous episode. Uh, homeowner's insurance has, in our area, skyrocketed. It, it almost went up, my homeowner from the previous year, almost like 200%. It was ridiculous when I got my my renewal notice. And so I shopped around and I found a new insurance company and reasonable rates, got better coverage, a lot lower rate, blah, blah, blah. So uh, I had the guy come out, the insurance guy. We talked, he took his pictures, you know, did whatever. So I'm here at the studio uh, yesterday morning and, uh, you know, doing some editing, getting the content out for you leadheads. Uh, and, um, of course, I wear these he these these headphones. 
So I, I can't hear if somebody's at knocking at my door or the doorbell rings or something like that. So I get up to, to go take a break. And as I'm walking through the house, I look out the back window and I see somebody walking in my backyard. <laughs> I'm like, what the hell? So I look out front, see if I see any cars. I didn't see any cars. Um, so I go back and, uh, by this time I don't, I don't see where he's gone to a blind spot and he's come back around front. So I go out front and I'm like, Hey dude, what's going on? He's like, Oh, nothing. I'm just, uh, I'm just here. I'm with the insurance company. We're supposed to get some pictures and do some evaluations. And this guy wasn't dressed professionally for one. He was like in sweats and he had this clipboard that looked like it'd been out in a rainstorm. It was all weathered and junky. He did have like a, a lanyard thing on, but of course I couldn't see it from where I was. And I was like, so you just, you just come on people's property without um, invitation or permission. He goes, well, they called, they called to let you know. I was like, no, nobody called. Let me know that you were coming. I got no calls, no messages. And I checked my phone just to verify and I had nothing. Uh, and he's like, well, you know, we, we do this all the time. He's like, they call ahead and then we just come and then, and then we do the, the inspections. I was like, well, he goes, I knocked on your front door. I was like, I didn't, didn't hear you. Sorry. He's like, I had my headphones on, you know, whatever. Uh, so we're kind of going back and forth. He's just not getting that. He shouldn't go on people's property unless he has express permission, like coming to the front door, knocking, letting people know that you're there and then, you know, them giving you permission to do it. Um, I had my gun, <laughs> obviously. Oh, he's got my gun. So he was looking at that and he was kind of, you know, he was really nervous about the whole thing. And I made no threatening moves toward him or what, or whatsoever. I was just trying to get his story. He hands me this business card. Again, it looks like it's been in a rainstorm. I'm like, this guy, I don't, he's questionable. I don't know if he's legit or not. So I'm like, you just stay right there. I'm going to call my insurance guy and, and see what's up here. Because, I mean, there's something sketchy about you, dude. So I call my insurance guy, and he's like, yeah, sh yeah. Oh, uh, they they do that. It's a routine thing. They send people out there. I said, do they send them out there without the owner's permission to, to go? I have a fence, too. So he has to go through my fence, open my fence, and, and go to the backyard there. Um. And he's like, well, no, they they call ahead and get permission. I was like, well, he didn't. <laughs> I got no permission. So meanwhile, this guy's still standing out in your backyard. No, he's standing right here in front of me. And oh, okay. no, he'd already left my backyard. He was in the front yard. So I confronted him in the uh, front driveway is where I confronted him. And uh, so, I mean, he's standing there the whole time. Just, you know, I don't know if he was high or, or what. He just <laughs> he just seemed out of it. He was like, no, this is, this is usual routine. So we get done with the call and he's like, yeah, he goes, I have this happen quite a bit. Uh, I had a lady pull a shotgun on me the other day. I was like, at what point do you stop trespassing on people's property? I mean, I understand you got a job to do, dude, but trespassing is trespassing. I mean, I could have by all rights, um, you know, I wouldn't have shot him, but unless he was doing something that deserved it, but. I mean, I, I could have very well physically assaulted him and, you know, taken him down or whatever, but I didn't. I just, I, I was like, I could tell he was, he was upset. And I was like, you know, I apologize. I just had to verify what was going on here. You should not trespass on people's property <laughs> because you, obviously you've ran into this before. You could get shot. So I called his superiors and I let them know what happened there too. And, uh, of course, they were apologetic and all that. We're so sorry. Uh, we were supposed to have called you, but we didn't. Bom, 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 bom. Oh. So I'm like, okay, I just hired you guys as my new insurance company, and you and you failed uh, uh, right off the bat. So uh, <laughs> something to look forward to. Shelter insurance, but they've got great rates so far. Well, have you had it? I'd file a claim yet. Do they have any money? <laughs> no, this just <laughs> this just happened. But they, they, uh, the mortgage company did make the deposit because our um, insurance and stuff gets paid through the mortgage. Can't we just put mm -hmm. it in with the mortgage and have, have all that done through the mortgage? So, but they did cut them a check for it, and I, I went ahead and switched my auto over and everything. But they beat 
like their prices that I had with farmers, I had farmers and I'll call farmers out cause they're jack wagons for jacking up rates. Like they did, um, half, they were half and I'm getting better coverage. So, um, I mean, I'll put up with a little trespassing, I guess for that. <laughs> What about you? Uh, how's the insurance and everything going up there in West Virginia? Have you checked yours lately? Um, well, we've only been here for two years. And quite honestly, my wife does the financial stuff for the house. I don't even know. Oh, I'm sure she's on top I'm of not, it. Then. I'm not entirely sure who our insurer is. I, I know that we've been, it's been a cold winter. So uh, our electric bills have, have gone up. Yeah, uh, can I do too. a jack wagon? Absolutely. Please. All right. By all means. <clears throat> Mine's going to be far more general than this. Um, I do, since we've moved here, I've become part of a, a radio team. I have a, um, I'm a co-host on a, a radio show, FM station here What's in it Martinsburg, called? West Virginia. What's it called? Uh, WRNR, Eastern Panhandle Talk. Eastern Panhandle the, Talk. Okay. Show. We've got listeners up is, there so they could tune in. This is an election year and West Virginia, you know, we're, my son is out and ground, you know, we're, we're past the, the, the little kids stage. But West Virginia is 50 of 50 in terms of educational scores. We are the, the bottom. Huh? In, at the bottom, we are the most truant. We have the least well-paid teachers. Mississippi used to save us because they would be the one that was right. worst, and, and they had a good year. So we're 50 of 50. And this is an election year. <clears throat> so as part of this radio gig, I'm, I interview they're candidates for governor because Governor Justice is running for the Senate. He's been term limited out of the governor's mansion. So um, he's taking going for Joe Manchin's slot along with, you know, a bunch of other folks. Right. So you interview these politicians and you ask them questions. And the the political speech is so freaking infuriating. Because while well, we're going to get gather the, the best minds to work on this problem and we need to bring both sides together and we need there's never a plan. And the so much of the political discourse, both locally and at the, uh, the national level, is about how bad the other guy is, which doesn't resonate all that well in West Virginia because it's a Republican supermajority. Right? They, they've got the House, they got the Senate by a lot. Right. And then they've got the governor's mansion. They will have the governor's mansion. I think Trump carried West Virginia by 85%. So, I mean, it's not, it's not even close. Right. So you have all these people who are in violent agreement and you, you do the trash talking thing. Nobody has a plan. So this is what, this is my <laughs> campaign. I'm not running for anything, but this is my campaign for politicians. Right. The first one that comes up with an inspiring message, you know, Reagan's old shining city on a hill this that we're going to create this good thing and this is how we're going to create this good thing i am going to lead you from where we are to where we want to go and have some solid plans i'm voting for that guy and i get so frustrated with the political mumbo jumbo <clears throat> it seems at the point of election they have is simply the, elected hit the keywords yeah hit the buzzwords and just say the buzzwords and have nothing to uh, no meat and potatoes behind, it, like you said, not have a plan as to how you're going to accomplish these buzzwords. Right. And, be, and because if you have a plan, now your opponent has something to pick apart, which is OK. I mean, if it's a bad plan, it should be picked apart. Yeah. But I don't know. That's 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 my frustration. And it's it's going to peak. It's going to be a long year for me because I get so tired of this. Just somebody come on. So, somebody stand for something and, yeah. and bring us there. And what and. I mean, quite literally, what is what are people's stances now? What's the left stance? What's the right stance? What's what's the independent stance? I, I it's not clear to me on what their stances are. Well, it's not. You know, at the national level, well, here's the thing. You know, at the national level, the extremes dictate everything. Yeah. So you know, the I don't think the maybe I'm just being hopeful. I don't think the rank and file. Democrat is really a hardcore socialist that hates America. I don't believe that at all. But that's the drumbeat that gets the news, certainly in the right wing media. And nor is are the Republicans all these, you know, uh, hardcore right wing folks. Um, but that's what attack. That's what the left wing media 
uh, shows. So we don't know. Yeah. I, I don't think I don't. Americans are no longer in a position because the media is so screwed up. No, we're not, not in a position to make informed decisions anymore unless you really go looking for it. Yeah. And, and that's the thing. I mean, it's out there if you want to educate yourself. Uh, you know, critical thinking, it's, it's a lost art. We, we don't have that. We don't teach that in schools anymore. We don't teach our kids that. Uh, how to go out and, and, you know, get your own version of something. Listen to both sides of it and then go out and then find another side uh, until, you know, you feel comfortable with the issue rather than just taking somebody's word for it, which is what uh, it seems like the majority of Americans do these days is they just listen to you know, nobody listens to CNN anymore, but whatever the, the new left media, who's the new big left media? What's the one that people listen to these days? I have no idea. I, uh, I, 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 I actually watch very little. I don't get any of my Fox. News from, is it Fox? <laughs> is that the, the well, some would say that I suppose. Is that the new <laughs> left wing? But, but no, I mean, that's, that's the thing. And you know, how do, how do you as an interested and concerned American, um, go and get the facts, get the information. Where do you, where do you go? Where can you trust a good source? You know, that's the thing is I don't even know where to tell people to do that. All I know is to go to all the sources and because as an educated person, just as a person, if you've got any common sense whatsoever, you can tell what's bullshit and what's not bullshit. So you can go and you can read an article at five different places, and if they're all saying the same thing, you know, then you know it's scripted. You know, this mm-hmm. is it's an agenda. They've got an agenda. Here's their agenda. Well, if you know what their agenda is, then you kind of look at the the transverse side of that and say, okay, why would they have this agenda? So you got to ask yourself questions. It's not something that you can just take at face value. You have to dig deep and. Uh, I just don't think people have the time or want to take the time anymore to do that. And they're just, it's like gambling. You know, they just gamble that this guy's going to do the right thing or this party or this lady or, you know, whoever is going to do the right thing. And that's just not the case these days. Well, and I think part of it is driven that we've demonized um, compromise. You know, if, 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 if you and I are elected officials and we're on the different side of an issue, uh, we are one Twitter post from a third party from being torn apart by our constituents because we sit down and have lunch together yeah. or we go and we have a drink together and we show that we're friendly with each other. That gets us canceled. So and, and I think that's true that I think that's boiled down to a lot of friendships and my own extended family, quite honestly, the <clears throat> my brother and his wife on an entirely different part of the political spectrum than I am, but they won't talk about anything. Yeah. They just assume, they assume that things are going to get angry. And I don't get, I get frustrated with these things. Um, but I don't get angry. Um, in fact, I think that by having intelligent discussions with people on the other side of a political issue, you learn things Mm -hmm. and you realize that as, as much as you disagree with this other smart person, that they are smart and that they are coming from their entirely different point of view from a very honest place. Sure. So, you know, it, it, and I think it's important to recognize that. No, absolutely. And, and I think, I think you hit on a key aspect there is, is the face to face interaction with people is we've mm-hmm. lost, we've lost that. I mean, take for instance, you and me right now. I mean, this is about as, as face, this is common. This is common face to face now. Um, but it, there, there's something different about actually being with someone and sitting down and talking about, you know, these important issues and getting both sides of it. It's like, well, why do you feel that way? You know, get get the true feeling behind it. Uh, it I'm the same way with my family. It's like I can't have a political – you can't talk politics. You can't talk um, uh, religion uh, because it all just boils to a head and steams up and – you know, everybody's arguing and mad at each other, and then you've ruined the birthday party or the Christmas celebration, you know, or whatever. So uh, those are off limits at, you know, any kind of family gathering. But I get what you're saying. You know, it, it's important to sit down with someone who thinks differently than you and have a calm, rational discussion, whether it's over coffee or, you know, mm-hmm. a meal or, you know, whatever it may be, or just sitting, you know, sitting around. Um, but 
you got to do that. And that's how you better understand where that side's coming from rather than the media. And why do you think the media, John, I, I'd love to get your take on this. Why do you think the media has become weaponized, whether it's through political or through individual corporations, whoever's whoever's weaponized the media to tear us apart and, and keep us at each other's throats? What, why, what do they gain by that? Money. I think that, you know, the, the old cliche has been if it bleeds, it leads. That goes way, way back to the ancient times of print journalism. I have some uh, dear friends of mine who um, coming, I used to be a part of the National Press Club and all that sort of the, as never, I've never been a reporter, but I've been a writer in the DC area. Right. So I know a lot of the journalists, many of whom have been fired by the big papers. We don't do, I mean, Washington Post is a shadow of what it used to be, both in terms of its writing talent and its writing staff. Yeah. And the ones who remain are under a great deal of pressure to get clicks. You know, nobody reads paper papers anymore. Yeah. So now there's there's a rush to get get a story, whatever it is, false or otherwise. You can always you can always blame it on an unnamed source. Mm -hmm. And you you get it out there and the money comes with the click. There's really no downside to getting the story wrong. I think that that there's a shamelessness among the media now that they've just sort of adopted it and adapted to it yeah. and and we're all suffering as a result so it ultimately it comes down to uh, the the clickbait that's that's where the money is and if you're not bringing in that money then the the news media the news outlet is is not paying its bills so you, you think that the these news we call it news it's not news uh anymore but these corporation news corporations uh their ultimate goal obviously is money is to make money it's not to report the truth but it's to keep us at odds with one another to keep us divisive you know, it's divided keep us divided i think that there's a cynical element of of the political universe that does that i think that there's you look at the resistance now and not to go into the details because in all fairness i haven't read this new senate bill on on uh, closing the border but I, you you can hear the spin that, that's that's already happening that you know if you if a pox on all their houses I'll complete a sentence here but I I need to put out there that yeah. there's my the level of cynicism that I have toward the American political system which I think is the best political system in the world but my levels of cynicism <laughs> are are through the roof that's and I'm not saying it's that, good that's not saying it's a good system but it, it's the it's better than others yeah it's better than most yeah. Um, but if, if an issue is resolved, you don't have an issue to campaign on anymore. And if, and that means you got to find another issue to campaign on. So if we can keep, it's like the drug war, the, the drug pillow fight yeah. that we've been having. You've got to have last, a fight. You've got to have something to be against. Yeah. You have yeah. to have something to be against. And angry people vote. Yeah. And Outraged. angry people vote against the other side. They vote against the people they're angry at. They don't vote for the person with the shiny city on the hill, which is what I'm looking for. Right, right. But and, you know, and I'll I'll back up a little bit. I I think our political system, the way it, it is designed, the way it was designed, originally designed and and executed when it's executed the way it's supposed to, you know, is the best. You know, we have the best system. We have the best country when it's when it's run the way it's supposed to be, and that's mm -hmm. it's not these days and it's painfully obvious you being an american history uh are you a professor or did, oh god no. No, okay. no 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 all right you, i know you majored in in american history and so i you, did so you and know a lot idea. about you know where we came from to where we are today and you know based on what you learned and um you learned back and i'm not saying you're old don't <laughs> you can say it you're a little bit older than me truth, you're, you're not much older than me we're probably about the same age um but people were taught a, a different way back back in the day you know there was no agenda other than educating and teaching what the history books laid out they weren't, weren't people trying to change history and say you know well, this didn't happen and that didn't happen but it happened this way. It didn't happen that way. And you know, we're getting all this controversy and people are getting confused. And 
Um, how do you see the way that you were educated on American history and politics to to where we are today with this with the education of our our youth? Well, I think that um, you're right. I was taught without an obvious um, agenda that was being taught. I was also taught that within context, you know, the, the things people did when they did it also had a why, you know, and they, and th they didn't have the uh, perfect foresight to know, you know, what would cause what. So, I mean, you get to the, the war of Northern aggression, by the way, is what I was taught. So, I mean, that, that goes back yeah. to, uh, you know, quite a ways. I had a professor in college who actually, uh, his mother was a, a nurse at the old Confederate soldiers home in Richmond. Oh, wow. So this is a guy and he was old in, when I had him in college. Yeah. But he grew up and that's how far we are away from the civil war. Yeah. And, uh, it's just, it, it's a couple of generational handshakes and we're there. I mean, we're close. I mean, it's still in, in the terms yeah. of history. It just happened yesterday. Exactly. And the scars are not all that healed as a result of that. And um, there is there's a pervasive states' rights versus federalism. You know, all the, those are all arguments that go way, way back to yeah. the very beginning. You know, between Alexander Hamilton and, and Thomas Jefferson, totally different ideas on how the government should be structured. But people talk to each other back then, and things happen in slow motion. You know, the Federalist Papers were um, editorials published over the course of years, right? As opposed to tweets that go out right now that then have to be responded to right away. Yeah. So I, I think the history happens slowly and the news cycle happens quickly. And we're, we're trying to weaponize the I mean, American history is it's beautiful and it's ugly. It's like any other history, right? Sure. Um, but once you have one side that is trying to weaponize our history against those whose whose livelihood, their, their their whole family, their family tree is part of that history, it, it's just it, we have this anger. There's this undercurrent of anger and dismissiveness and inability to listen to each other that I think is now translating into the schools. Schools are yeah. no longer teaching the way they were when when we were in school sure but on the other hand and and that's not necessarily I, a bad thing uh no. because you know as you as you as technology grows and you know different ways of doing things become but what you're saying is the the content as, as to what they're teaching is completely different so the way we were taught the civil war went down is not the way kids are taught today how the civil war went down well and then and with the added emphasis that one side was inherently evil i know that thomas jefferson mm -hmm. yes thomas jefferson owned slaves yes he's one of those brilliant people to ever walk the earth which which one do we lean on i don't think i ever i was always aware that thomas jefferson had slaves but we really leaned on his brilliance more than the negative of yeah. his possession of slaves. Well, people and just want to automatically, that, like you say, cancel or dismiss or mm -hmm. invalidate the the genius of an individual because of, all right, well, they had slaves. So that negates anything and everything else that they ever did in their life. Right. And we can stipulate, I will stipulate, Slavery is bad. Owning human beings. We all know that, bad, and we shouldn't have to right? say that. You know that, and you that's what's so. You shouldn't have to say that. We, we but you also have understood. to take. And, and Thomas Jefferson understood that he was he was coerced into taking it out of his draft of the uh, Declaration of Independence. So, um, to to vilify someone because of the time where they lived, that they were trying to evolve out of, just makes no sense to me. And, and what it does is it, it foments anger. Yeah. This is it's ignorance. Yeah. yeah. It, and this is an angry country. It is angry country. It is a lot angrier than, than it used to be. And that, you know, that's kind of what I'm trying to get to the core of is who has made us angry? 
who who has done this to us? I mean, yeah, I know we've done it to ourselves, but when you start, you know, indoctrinating the children into these certain thought patterns, then you know it's it's more deep seated than that. I'm a I like conspiracy theories <laughs> kind of deal. Who doesn't you know? And I, I make my living off of conspiracy theories. What's just the fiction. best way to topple? You know, a a powerful entity, you know, is is to destroy it from within, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. If you if you can play the long game, the slow long game, then you know that that's what I see that's happened to our country over, you know, the past fifty, seventy, eighty years. Is yes, something has infiltrated, and, and it's just slowly, you know built up to where we are today and it, and until we it just explode until we pop until our roman empire collapses yes and the the pessimist in me the novelist in me um sees us accelerating toward that time here's lefty this is what i think is really scary about all this the united states i guess governments in general but the united states yeah. in particular yeah. is built strictly on an idea And the idea is all men are created equal and we are endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights. And I'm not going to recite all of that because we we know all of those things. But the we're moving away from that where the government is now telling people that you must do this. You must wear a mask. You must stay home. You may not leave your home. And people are saying, okay, which in those are the COVID years that I found really frightening yeah. because yeah. who the hell are you to tell me what I can do in my house? Right. And, but that's the new norm. And we were, we're seeing a shift that for those who are defending natural rights, natural being God given rights are being portrayed as, I don't know, uh, you know, it's going to be racist because it's, that's the label that gets thrown first. Sure. And, the, and nobody's pushing back, at least at a, I don't think people are pushing back enough. They're not. The whole notion of your guy in a backyard, right? Yeah. Who the hell was he to be in your backyard? Right. You know, he knocks on the door. That doesn't give him permission yeah. to go to you. And you know what he back. told me? He goes, right. he goes, very few people ever say anything to me about this. He goes, he goes, I'm glad that you said something about it. He said, but you normally people just like, oh, okay, whatever. And I was like, no, it's not right. You shouldn't do this. He goes, you're right, but um, I do it. And nobody, you know, usually nobody ever says anything. He said, I have the occasional, the lady pulled the shotgun on me. You've confronted me. Uh, But I was shocked to hear that too. I was like, so you just, you just trespass on people's property all the time. And that's what, that's what you're saying. Basically the government has done is our rights are more privileges now. Yes. Our government sees them as privileges even though they are our rights and because we're not pushing back, you know, they just keep, they just keep easing in a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more to, and then they don't stop. They'll just, you know, they'll just back off a little bit, but then they'll continue again down this road and they'll push a little bit further each time they're gaining ground because we're not, we're not standing our ground. Yes. And the, well, one of the reasons I left Virginia was the, the political climate of, of Virginia went from a deep, deep red state to a bright blue state in a matter of two elections. And I don't, I don't, I'm not enough of a student of these things to know what happened, but I know that all of a sudden the stuff I was taking for granted was be, I, I couldn't do so much anymore, whether it comes down to guns or, or speaking or whatever. Yeah. So I moved to West Virginia. You know, West Virginia is a constitutional carry state. West Virginia is built around the notion of leave me alone. Yeah. And, and they're, and they're good at that. And I think that's what Americana used to be. It did. And, uh, I don't, again, I don't know how deep we want to go into this. I, I think our immigration policies, we're bringing in a lot of folks from socialist nations who have never mm-hmm. really understood the concept of what a representative republic is. And they what, don't. What they have no idea are. what it is. Yeah. So they want government to take care of. Why wouldn't you want government to take care of you? Let rich people pay for it. Yeah. And that's what they're getting here. And that's why that, I I don't know. I mean, they just, they're letting them in 
by the drone. We know the problem at the border. You know, we know what's going mm-hmm. on there. Um, but you know, why? Why are they doing that? What What does that serve them? It gives them more power, is what it does, because you got more people dependent on them. That as they get in here, and if they're illegal aliens, but yet they're allowing them to get their citizenship, then they're going to be thankful for those people because oh, I'm getting my health care paid for. I'm getting my education and you know everything else paid for. Well, this isn't a socialist country. This country wasn't founded and based on socialism. You know, you they have to work for this stuff. You know, we work we work for everything that we've got. Nothing mm-hmm. was given to me. You know, I still have to fight tooth and nail for for everything that I've got, everything that I get. Um, I don't ask for handouts for the government, even though I probably could. I mean, I don't know. I, I've never looked into it <laughs> because it's just it's not something that uh, I feel entitled to at all. Well, I don't. And I think that's one of the great cultural clashes here is that most of us of a certain age, we grow up. Nobody owed me anything. Nobody, you know, it's my, my parents always, always loved me, always gave me a, a, a meal and, and sure. a roof over my head and they cared for me. Right. Sure. But, but, but I had to I, work for that too. Cause I had to do chores around the house, you know? I yes. To, yeah. I got my first job outside the house when I was 14. I've been working ever since. And it was, that's not a yeah. complaint. It's no. just what it, you did. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, you better get good grades in school while you're working on the side too. You know, one, you, there's no excuse. Yeah. Not you you want to play sports, that. you want to play baseball, football. Well, your grades have to stay up. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you have to maintain your grades and you know, that was just expected. And that's what, that's what we did. If, if you slipped, then you lost that. Those were privileges, you know, right. It was a privilege to be able to, to play sports or to, or to have that job, that extra, you know, job to go and earn a little extra gas money or whatever it was. But yeah, I'm like you. I mean, I started, I think I was 12. I started working in a tobacco barn, sweeping the floors, Ooh. you know, at a, t- uh, uh, auction house, tobacco auction house. <laughs> that was like my first like job, job. I was like 12 years old. It's probably, you know, illegal. I don't think you can, can hire kids, but I mean, I was on the payroll. I got a check and there, you know, everything. And you felt good about it. You felt like you felt were doing great. Yeah. I was like, this is awesome. You know, I'm, I'm actually earning a living. I'm making my own money. I don't have to, I hated dusting and mowing the yard and, you know, doing, I still had to mow the yard, but you know, I got out of the little house chores because <laughs> it's like, okay. But yeah, I mean, that's the thing. It was, it was, it was, we have lost that. Um, and I don't know because laws that are passed too. I mean, you put a kid to work at 12 nowadays, then you're, you're seen as a, a child trafficker, you know, and, You'll go to jail. Um, and I'm not making light of child, child trafficking because it is no, an issue no, no. and is it a problem. You know, it is a big problem. Yeah, it's been it's probably been ten years now. But in Montgomery County, Maryland, which is another it's a Maryland DC suburb, uh, there was a, a uh, I think it was fourteen year old girl and her maybe twelve and nine or fourteen and ten, whatever it was, two sisters were walking by themselves through Montgomery County is a very wealthy area to the local park. And one of the neighbors called because the children were endangered. The police came Mm. to the parents and gave them a hard time for endangering their children simply because the children were allowed to walk outside by themselves. Oh my gosh. And you think, really? I mean, it it went, I mean, it went to court. They, They prevailed. Parents prevailed. God, I hope so. But this is, Again, who are you to tell me what I can do with my kids? We accept this right now as, I mean, current young parents with young kids, they seem to be very accepting of this that, well, you know, I'm not, I'm not allowed to do this with my kid. Yeah, you really are. You know, you just, you really are just have to grow a pair and say, I'm going to do it my way. You have, you have to push back. It's not, and it's not just standing ground because, because as I said, they keep pushing and pushing and they take and they take. If we stand our ground, well, they've already taken that much. And then when they start pushing again and we stand our ground, then they've taken a little bit more. We have to push back. You have, you have to get back what they've already taken. You can't just say, all right, it's enough's enough. We're going to, you know, stop it right here. You got you got to push back and, and, and get a lot of these freedoms and laws changed 
But it's tough because once, what do they say? Once the law's in place, it's impossible to get it. Well, I mean, you take the uh, one of the greatest governmental fumbles, the greatest in my lifetime, and I think one of the greatest in history was the management of of the pandemic nonsense. Um, it was yes, it was it was a real disease, and yes, real people died of the real disease, but people die every day of something. We shut down everything. We ruined kids' educations. We ruined kids' childhoods, and <clears throat> the fact that people like um, uh, Michigan, Whitmer, um, the, the governor up there continued to double down even after we knew that shut, shutting down schools was hurting kids yeah. and that, you know, the, the masking issue wasn't accomplishing anything. They continued to double down and arrest people for, for exercising their natural right to do, to do whatever they want right. because the government got the power and they like the power. They exempt themselves from the power, of course. Yeah. But, we as a nation need to hold these people accountable. I'm not saying throw them in jail. But yeah, I am. Fire them. I am. They definitely need to be thrown in jail. A lot of them need to be thrown in jail for their abuse of their so-called so-called power. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was just pure and blatant. They got on a power trip, and those people should be thrown in jail. Fauci needs to be in jail. Oh. In jail, 100. percent He needs to be behind bars in jail. Just, well, just recently he came out and he said he doesn't know where this whole six foot separation thing came from. <laughs> that was that was because it really doesn't it doesn't mean anything. No. Um, yeah, that that I am nowhere near as angry a fellow as I was during the COVID years. <laughs> it yeah. was just, but I that's a prime example it. of how the government abused their power and took away rights, freedoms from us. And made the, made us feel like it was a privilege, and gaslighted people into thinking that it was for their benefit. Yeah, and then it got politicized. And if you if you try to talk against it, first of all, you get deplatformed. Which, uh, well, you're in the entertainment business too. At least in your corner of it, I'm in a different I, corner. Of the I, I experience it every D- day. Deplatform's a big deal. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm what is it? Um, shadow banned. I've been shadow banned since since day one. So. Uh, the followers and and you know everything that I get on my social media is grassroots. Those are you know leadheads through and through. Those aren't bought. You know we talked about this on our last episode. Leadheads, uh, Tun Jones was talking about. You know you see these people that have millions and millions of followers. Well, they buy them. They're they're um, it's a business. There's companies out there that will sell you these fake accounts. You know, you've heard about these um, these farms that they have of people sitting in computers that oh yeah just all the yeah you know, th- and that's what they are. They're, you know, they generate all these fake accounts, and you can buy those accounts, and then you can buy comments. You can buy, uh, yeah, you could people you can buy that, John, <laughs> and people wow. do. So you see all these people with with all these millions and millions of followers, uh, and you're like, how do they, how do they get that? Well, the majority of them are buying them. You know, they're buying the likes, they're buying the comments, they're buying the followers and they sell it that way. And and you can buy likes, you can buy followers, you can buy comments kind of deal. Okay. Are they expensive? I mean, I I don't know. I've never done it. I've never, I was like, more power too. If you want to, you know, do that, do that. That that's great. But uh, I'm sure it's not cheap. And then I guess as you, you know, if you're buying more and more and then these companies see that, oh, he's got a million followers, I'm going to get behind them and support them. And, you know, if they get more money, then they're going to buy more followers. They're going to buy more likes. They're going to buy more comments. But uh, Tracy, Tracy Guns, who was on the show, uh, and Ton, they were both telling us how you can kind of weed through and see if if this is like a, a bought account kind of deal. It's because a lot of people won't buy all three. They'll buy maybe two. And then not the other. Most of them will buy the the followers and the likes, but they won't buy the comments. So if you go and look and say they got a million followers and they get, you know, so many likes on this post, but there's like two comments, you know, or something like that, then, you know, they're not buying the comments part of it. No. Wow. And it, and then I, the, the upside to that is with 
X number of, of followers, then you get more sponsorships and that is that the, well, is that and, the and that's what, it, because these, these corporations, these companies that get behind these people, they're like, Oh, they got, I'm getting my product out to all these people in front of all these people that are basically fake bots, uh, but they don't do the research and, and find that out. They're just, Hey, they got 10 million followers. Here's, you know, however much money, blah, blah, blah. Now I can answer to my board and say, Oh, but look at all the people that look at all the exposure we're getting, you know, kind of deal. So, but our sales aren't up. What's up with that <laughs> kind of deal? So, no, I mean, there, there's ways to do it, I guess, but it, it, obviously it's harder and harder to do with the way technology is, especially with AI, artificial intelligence, where it's headed these days. I don't think AI necessarily is a bad thing. I think it can be used in a bad way, but it's just like anything else. You know, anything else that's like nuclear power. Nuclear power is great. You know, it's a great resource for us to use, and, and I think we should use it, but then also it can be abused and, you know, bombs can be made from from nuclear power and kill millions and thousands and entirely different technologies or diff different approaches to the technology but you're right i mean it, yeah. it's a uh, uh ai scares me and and not because you know somebody's going to write a book and put their name on it it's an ai book and, and that's well, i'm sure I there's think I, i'm sure they're out there i'm sure people have done i'm sure that. there are yeah there are pirated books too you know i don't you know there there are things worth staying up over and and others that that aren't sure what worries me about ai is you know in in the like 4.0 and and 6.0 versions of these things imagine you're uh, a warship and the ai in, in invades your radar and you see a bunch of incoming missiles from over there and you don't have a lot of time to respond because it's incoming so returning the fire that's those are the uses of ai that really terrify me yeah and war games remember that movie war games i do remember that movie that's exactly what war games was was about that was before artificial intelligence was right. artificial intelligence um shall we play a game yeah <laughs> exactly and it was just a simulation but everybody thought that the russians were firing their missiles and but yeah i mean there's been lots of of different movies and scenarios that are based on the same thing but uh, you know, music, AIs writing, writing songs, writing music, um, writing articles. Um, and you know, I think, I think the AI is being used in the political game more than people realize too. Yeah. And there's the, I think it's called the deep fake is, is the corner of AI where you, you can animate a picture of a politician. Oh, Yes, and Something. and have them do things that they never did, like uh, Taylor Swift. That was just in the news. I I saw the other day. Apparently, somebody did a deep fake uh, pornography with using Taylor Swift's image, and and that's what's got all these liberals up in an uproar over AI now, is because one of theirs just got targeted and you know brought into it in a shameful, disgraceful way, I guess. And now you know they're calling for all this. Um, legislation to control and and uh, regulate. That's the you know the word they like regulate regulation. Mm -hmm. That's when the government's going to get involved and ruin everything. Um, right. So yeah, I think we're going to start seeing a lot more regulation on the AI technology. But I think it, again, I think I think there's a lot more good that that could come from AI than than harm. Well, certainly when you get into the sciences and um, yeah, I, I'm sure AI is not 100 percent bad. You know, I like when I start typing in a Google search and it finishes the search for me. I It's convenient. Right. I don't yeah. I don't have a problem. Sometimes. That. <laughs> Except well, that yeah. autocorrect on my phone because it never gets it right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Introducing our new belly band holster. Whether you're hitting the gym or running a quick errand. Our belly band is one of the most comfortable and safest ways to carry your firearm. The center section allows you to carry most common pistols. Left or right-handed, this has you covered. A hard laminate trigger shield protects the firearm's trigger from unwanted intrusion, giving you ease of mind while carrying every day. Two elastic sleeves give you the flexibility to carry other everyday items, such as spare mats, flashlight, knife, or pepper spray. 
Two zippered pockets run on both sides, offering the option to carry smaller items, such as money, cards, or keys. Flush fit on your lower back or waist, easily keeping your setup discreet no matter how you choose to carry. Utilizing 3D spacer mesh, these channels allow for exceptional and efficient airflow, giving you maximum comfort and keeping you cool. Carry whenever you want, how you want, with our new belly band holster. Available now. Go to missionfirsttactical.com, use the code LEADHEAD for an exclusive listener-only 20% discount. So, technology is moving faster than I think we know how to keep up with it. This this is every science fiction book from the fifties. You know, it's, yeah, it, it, it's it, coming to fruition. Computers are taking over, and we don't know what to do. Coming to fruition, but you know, that's kind of that's kind of where your book with the uh, Victoria Emerson uh, series is 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 kind of where we're headed right now. Is is like if this continues, then that's the world we're going to live in. And uh, White Smoke is your latest um, Victoria Emerson book. So talk about White Smoke a little bit. And it looks just like this. Look at that. Um, White Smoke is the third book in the Victoria Emerson uh, trilogy. And the, the basis of the trilogy is that a misunderstanding between um, Israel and Iran start a nuclear war. There was a plan. That doesn't sound familiar. Point, no, I know this. And and I wrote this well before any of the real stuff happened, which, you know, it gets yeah. me a little nervous, but, um, Israel was, had a plan and was going to, uh, nuke actually Iran's nuclear facilities. And it was going to be a surprise attack. And, but the government relocated just in case, because nukes are going to be involved to the government relocation center, which is a real thing. It used to be at the Greenbrier Hotel in um, White Sulphur Springs, but it's not there anymore. And um, in the news media leaked the plan and Iran fired first and then Russia got involved. And once Russia launched, the United States had to launch. And so it becomes, it's an eight hour war that leaves the, the world devastated. And while there are billions of people, we presume, don't know because it's kind of a closed, it's a, a, a limited point of view story. Right. Billions of people died, but billions of people lived. So this is a survival story about how Victoria Emerson uh, walked away. She was part of the um, West Virginia House of Delegates, actually, or House of Representatives, West Virginia representative of the House of Representatives. And she walked away when she found out she couldn't bring her kids into the bunker, which is also true. And um, so it's a survival story of what do you do with all these feral human beings that Nobody trains for this kind of stuff, except Victoria happens to be something of a prepper, not hardcore, but, but, you know, has survival skills as do her kids. Yeah. So it's her leadership that rebuilds this, her, her corner of, of the universe, which is a fictional town of Ortho, West Virginia. And as word spreads of, of her, this, this real community that she's built out of the feral nothingness, people of course want to take it. And then in in uh, Blue Fire, which is the second book, the sort of the fight for survival in White Smoke is is the the final culmination of of what do we do with the, the really bad guy who has taken over the hotel complex that used to be the government relocation center. Right. So, but the what it really made me realize as I was writing the book is that it sort of touched on it before that the government is a concept and if they can't do if they can't protect you then what good are they and and in this case um you know if you think about the electromagnetic pulse i don't know how much you all have talked about this this sort of thing but the with an electromagnetic pulse everything gets wiped out so the government has all the best of everything and they're communicating messages that nobody can hear. So from, from the point of view of somebody who's in the middle of nowhere trying to survive, government is totally irrelevant. Money is irrelevant. What do I want? A picture of a dead president does not get me food. 
what gets me food is ammunition and something to shoot it through. Right. And so now the whole notion of currency changes through the, the course of these books. You're gonna and, you're gonna hate me too because uh, the video wasn't recording. <laughs> what the whole thing? The video, yeah, the video. I just started hit recording the video right now. Oh, oh wow, we lost that whole first hour or whatever it was <clears throat> yeah, of the video. I've got the audio. The audio has been okay. recording the whole time. So all right, I've got the audio. Um, I, I gonna say it's, a, it's a-, a new. It's a new software that I started using, and I thought I hit the recording button, but I hit the wrong button, apparently. Because I was looking, I was like, how long? Because there's usually a timer. Is it where's my timer? And now my timer's, uh, it's going. So. Sorry. No. Sorry, Leadheads. No, right. <laughs> uh, but I mean, there wasn't really anything video-wise that, I'll just put your picture of your book up the whole, for that. There you go. That'll work. That'll work. Um. Sorry about that. My bad. Yeah, that's all right. Uh, yeah, I'm very uh, embarrassed about that. That's first time that's happened. So. <laughs> Stuff, as they say, happens. Stuff happens. Um, but anyway, continue. So the the white smoke. You're, this is the the third in the victory. Is this the final? Are, are you gonna do? Are you gonna continue it, the Victoria? It's the final part of this part of the story. <laughs> okay. Um, and it just the reason it's it's newsworthy. It it just came out in paperback back in in December. So it's 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 gone from twenty six bucks down to ten bucks. A bargain. It's a steal. Yeah, it's, that is in today's um, in today's economy. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and actually, you know, books are underrated in terms of uh, how to spend time. You know, where else do you get? You know, for ten bucks, you get ten twelve hours of it depends on how you read, I guess. Yeah, of, of entertainment. Yeah, I mean it's all in your your pay, and then reread. You could reread it. I, I mean, I do that. I'll go mm-hmm. through and I'll read, you know, a book because I want to get through it, and I find that you know I miss things, so I'll go back and I'll reread and I'll pick up things that I, you know, didn't pick up on the first time or third, you know, do the third time. So, yeah. So you're a paper book reader or an ebook reader? So I do or both. I I like I like listening because you know for time, you know, I can go to the gym. I can put on my my earplugs and, you know, listen to two or three chapters while I'm working out, you know, and then continue to do others. So for time management, I re I, I listen, but then, uh, I do like the hardbacks too, because I do like having the, I'm old school. I like having it in my hand and I like going through I agree. And, and, uh, yeah, the audio, um, corner of the market is the, fastest growing part of the publishing industry right now. I can imagine. It, it's really, I, I'm shocked. It was rare that I ever heard people who said that they listened to my books. And now probably half of the people I talk to said that, say that that's how they I mean, it just makes sense. You're, you're sitting in traffic, you know, you're driving, you got an hour commute both ways, or two hour commute both ways. Uh, it just makes sense that instead of filling your head with this garbly goop that's on the, the radio these days, you... Mm-hmm actually get some entertainment or some education, you know, whatever it may be. The problem is for me, when I listen to a book, the reality of, of the book, it becomes more vivid than the reality of the 70 mile an hour traffic. <laughs> I have been known to blow past an exit and realize like 10 miles later. Yeah. Oh, crap. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's an inherent, um, danger, I guess, to it because, because I'm, I mean, like most people, I'm probably, you know, I get the picture in my head and I'm start visualizing in my head, what's going mm-hmm. on and kind of, so I don't typically listen to a book when I'm driving. I listen, I listen to a podcast or something like that, but uh, books, because I do like to get the mental visual and immerse myself into it. The gym is great because I don't have to be, you know, that aware of my surroundings when I'm at the gym. Uh, mm-hmm. If I'm mowing my yard, um, I'm, that's another place where I'll, if I'm doing yard work or something, if I'm at the range shooting, like I was, I went to the, to my farm this weekend and, and did some gun testing, you know, I'll have my either podcast or I'll be listening to somebody's book on tape or, you know, whatever it may be. But you, you put yours on audio, correct? Yours are available yes. on audio? Okay. Yes. All of them, ebook, paper book, audio, um, large who, print. Who reads yours? <laughs> For blind people. Do you have the I'm same sorry? person read yours every, um, 
every every novel? Well, for the most part, I don't arrange any of that. My publisher arranges all that stuff. But the um, Basil Sands is the voice of Jonathan Grave, which is the the longstanding freelance hostage rescue specialist um, series. Yeah, we're gonna. And the about lady that. who does White Smoke or the, the Victoria Emerson series, I'm told, is really good. I haven't I haven't listened to them. Oh, um, you haven't listened to your own books. <laughs> You know, by the lefty, by the time I'm done with a book, I've read that freaking thing so many times. I, I get that, I get that, but at the same time, I'm, I would be curious as to who's the voice of my character. Who are people listening to? What's this voice? And then it's like, wait a minute, that's not the voice. <laughs> that's not the well, voice. Well, it's never going to be the voice I hear. Yeah, right? I, I get that, it, I get it. But at the same uh, time, it could be like, oh, oh, she's really good, or you know what, she's just not really hitting it, kind of deal. I'm just that, hand, I guess I'm that anal a, about it. There's only two ways for it to go. On the one way, the best way is, wow, that's really terrific. Let's listen to my own brilliance for a while, which is a little unsettling. I, yeah, or I didn't mean it that way. Or, wow, that really sucks, and I can't do anything to fix it. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's the so. same It's the same thing with, with my podcast. I don't, I will listen to it to past episodes occasionally, like having you on, I'll go back and listen to the previous episode that I had you on one, just to make sure that we don't repeat anything or if there's something that we needed to pick up on that maybe we didn't cover, you know, in the first one. It, 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 and I hate listening to myself, you know, going through, cause I do my own editing. So when I go through this and I edit, you know, I'm not listening to me or, you know, whatever I've, it's, you know, I'm picking up on things to edit out or whatever, but um, I get what you're saying. Um, maybe it's just a self-conscious thing that you feel when you do that. Well, that could be too. Um, or honestly, I. Or do you have your you wife know, I, do I, it I, for I, you? I, I, I would be more inclined to go back and listen to a book that I wrote eight or 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And then it would be. I guess almost new material. You know, yeah. I'm surprised. I'm not, I don't remember every word that, that I wrote. Right. But right after a book comes out, I'm really tired of that book. Yeah. It's like I won't listen to the podcast right after it comes out. There's many that I haven't. After I edit, after I record it, and then I edit it, and then I'm done with it usually. And, you know, that's that. But yeah, I get what you're saying. I, I totally get that. But if I've got somebody else, like, Reading my book, I'm going to go, I probably would go and I would listen to, not the whole thing, but, you know, just, just to get a feel of where they're headed with it, you know, kind of deal. Mm -hmm. No, that's just me. But well, you got, you got to, people that do that, apparently. <laughs> well, you know, it's, I, I've listened to more of the, the, uh, Jonathan Grave books. Yeah. Never, never cover to cover, uh, or sure. whatever it is on a recording. Yeah. Um, but I do want to hear some of the pronunciations of of words. Yeah. Now with Basil, we have he's the he's the uh, artist. We have a conversation before he sets down to record. So if there are particular words that um, have a uh, a cultural pronunciation, then you know I'll, I'll point that out to him. Right. Uh, so kind of get ahead of what I know could be problems. I'm going to see if. There is an audio sample that we can listen to here. Oh dear! <laughs> I'm gonna. I want to see. I want to see what uh, what the chick is. What she sounds like. Can does Amazon have like samples you can listen to? Audio samples. I think so. Look I think here. So. Here's Blue Fire. Here's an audio sample of Blue Fire. Okay. Um. Let me go share my screen. Where's Streamyard at? Here it is. Yeah, share screen. And here we go. All right, you see that? Did that come up? Yeah. Okay, good deal. Audio sample. All right. Okay. Get ready. Victoria Emerson heard the urgency in the tone before she understood the words. She pivoted toward the back door as she rose from the table that she'd transformed into a makeshift desk and what used to be a diner called Maggie's Place. Since the days immediately following the war, Maggie's had served as an ersat city hall. Victoria's knees scooted her chair across the wooden floor as she stood. What on earth is that? 
asked Ellie Stewart. They'd been meeting about the status of the clothing bank, now that the air had begun to smell like winter. What do you think? What do you think? Whatever it is, it sounds important. I, okay. Victoria yeah. opened the door. A horse approached at a full gallop. I can its rider, to her. her 14-year-old son, Luke, hung tight to the saddle horn with his left hand while he slapped the reins with his right. Never having sat a horse until a few weeks ago, he'd taken to it well, but he was pushing the beast way too hard on the asphalt roadway. Gotta get back to that screen. Blue fire, yeah. he yelled. Coming down the river, blue fire. Coming down the river. Victoria's heart doubled its rate. So that's that's the Victoria Emerson lady. Do you know that lady's name? Who's who's reading that? I do not. Usually I don't. they'll well, put should on, be right. Is it? Yeah, they usually put it on here. I don't see. I'm not seeing where it's at. If you go to see all formats and editions, right there. Yeah, <clears throat> it's free and if you got Kindle Unlimited. You can get it free. Yeah. Uh, Audible heart audiobook at the top. There we go. Kate Forbes. Kate Forbes. Kate okay. Forbes. There you go. Kate Forbes. So good job, Kate. Now let's find a Jonathan Grave. All right. Novel. Let's see. I'll just go here, click on you. So you guys go to Amazon. You go to Amazon.com. You can get all of John's books, audio, hardbacks here. Do you do autograph some copies? Do you sell autograph copies? Um, I autograph copies. I don't really know how to sell that one. I just finished. That's not out yet. Oh, okay. that comes out in the in the fall. Is is Harm's Way is, is the current one? All right, let's see. Ah, we got an audio sample from Harm's Way here. So, there we go. Right, let's let's listen. Listen, and this is Basil. Basil Sands. Basil, Sands. that's a made up name. <laughs> Including Max really and the other missionaries. <laughs> Chino shorts in various states of disrepair, T-shirts and sandals. Max smiled as Jansen explained that surface water was inherently dangerous, contaminated with all manner of pollutants from farm chemicals to human waste. He explained about bacteria and viruses, but he never touched on what Max assumed to be the common unasked question. Okay, I like Basil. Why should we listen to a guy from Texas who presumes to be smarter than we are? Max understood the underlying cynicism of the mission, if only because he prided himself in being a master cynic. J now, does he do um, different... Like for different characters, he'll do like a different kind of voice kind of deal. He'll do different shadings of of the voice, but he doesn't he doesn't perform. Right, uh, right, right, right. Yeah, the voice. I couldn't. He'll 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 lighten his tone for a, for a female voice, and and I guess I guess to have different voice over actors, I guess that's what they call them for mm -hmm. each character would probably be too expensive, wouldn't it? To to do that. Uh, well, now that that gets actually into a whole different art form. That's that's radio shows, which are coming back. Actually, a buddy of mine has written a couple of scripts for those. Oh, really? I listen to I have Sirius XM in my car, and I listen to radio classics a lot, which is the old radio shows that my parents listened to. Back, yeah, I've back called a day. couple of those. Yeah, it's pretty good storytelling, actually. But yeah. it's, it's lots of sound effects and yeah. different actors and all of that. Yeah. Do you know of any authors that are doing their books that way? Um, I do not. The closest that comes to it was the uh, the Harry Potter books, uh -huh. where I think his narrator was Jim Dale, who was a, a voice actor. Yeah. So he would actually do different, entirely different voices for right. the, the many different characters. But it's the same um, guy doing all of them. Right. Kind of deal. But yeah. clearly different. I would I mean, like to I would like to brilliant. listen to one to where each character has its own voiceover actor book uh, that's just something i think's missing that maybe there could be a market for i don't know i think that's an interesting thought they have to be more on the short story side than the uh on the novel side yeah you think uh, i would think so just because you think cost maybe yeah the cost that'd, that'd be a very expensive yeah. uh, proposition you know i auditioned to do my own audiobook you know to be <laughs> my own reader <laughs> did you really <laughs> I was quickly, yeah i was quickly turned down well, you don't have the right voice. Okay. 
I mean, you talk about after writing it, you get really sick after you wrote it and then had to read it. Uh, well, I foolish, I didn't really understand what all went into doing that. Um, I've since spent a fair amount of time with Basil at, at different conferences, and he has converted a closet, like a coat closet, a whole closet into his recording studio. So it's it's maybe five by five feet. It's a prison cell with all that eggshell um, yeah. foam on the inside. Yeah. And he sits and he reads for eight hours. And oh, sometimes wow. you got to, because the turnaround time for him is actually pretty short on these books. And I write hundred thousand word books. Um, and he'll do several takes to see which one works best. And then when you come back from a break, <clears throat> you have to make sure that you, you match the pitch in your, in your voice so that the reader or the listener in this case mm -hmm. doesn't, doesn't hear the, the change awkward switch. Yeah. There's a lot that goes into it. Yeah. Well, and that's kind of the thing too, is when you listen to the, the audio is you get in, you kind of get tranced because you, they do have that tone with their voice and they, they keep that tone and then you're just kind of, you know, you're, you're entranced with it. So I yep. get like, if they change the pitch, then that might take you out of the, the book. But that's why I would like to see, uh, a book done with different voiceover actors because I do get because that's the one thing I don't I don't like getting in that that trance. Mm -hmm. I like to be brought out of it with you know different pitches and different tones and different things like that. So you know that's just me. I would love to have um, one of those voiceover or two on the show to talk about you know what they do. I think that would be very interesting to hear how they go about doing that. Have you ever considered narrating good southern? Southern book yourself? Me? No. <laughs> no. No, I don't think you uh I don't think anybody wants to hear me other than uh having guests on to where I don't talk as much. So <laughs> the frustration in this for me, even in the, the little snippet you played from White Smoke, uh -huh. the and that is the first time I've I've heard her voice. Um that's, it's that's meaning surprising. no disrespect if you're listening to this program. It prints a little bit older than I, th I thought it would be and uh, kind of that raspy sound to it. Mm -hmm. And it's things like used to be called, as she said it, Maggie's place. Yeah. You know, it's Maggie's place in my head. It's runs together. Maggie's place. Right. Not so Maggie's when they're the place. words, the words I put on the page represent how they, I hear them in my head. So there's a frustration that comes when you hear somebody else reading it in, in the different way. Um, let's see what, let's see how she does on white smoke. Let's play a little sample here on white side. Right. See if it's the same. Within 15 minutes, Victoria's family had all gathered in the main room of Maggie's place. Adam was the oldest at 18, and his girlfriend, Emma, was pregnant, though not yet showing. So at Maggie's 16, place Caleb is recurring. had grown two inches in the past yeah. two months. Okay. He spent his days helping Doc Rory Stevenson, working on patients and learning cowboy medicine as a trade. Luke would turn 15 soon, and his work in Lavinia Sloan's blacksmith shop had broadened his shoulders and blackened his hands without darkening his outlook. Just like his father had been, Luke was an unapologetic optimist in all things. Thanks to a lifetime of training, all her boys were expert marksmen. First Sergeant Paul Copley was there, too, along with George Simmons and Joey Abbott. George, like Joey, was a lifelong resident of Ortho and a, its environs. And through them, Victoria avoided some of the social soon. landmines okay. that were so common in small towns. They knew the personalities and friendships. More importantly, they knew the lifelong enmities that existed between some. The letter was real. There was no forging the elaborate scrawl that was Penn Glendale's handwriting. Written on the reverse side of the stationery for the House of Representatives, on which the logo of the front had been marked out with heavy black ink, the letter explained much of what young Mr. Cameron had told her. Penn's was a personal plea for assistance. As she read the letter aloud, her voice choked at the concluding paragraphs. Vicky, I ask you to do this thing, to preside over our trial, not to avoid punishment, 
or to evade responsibility for the mess that the war has wrought. I ask so that some semblance of sanity might reign over this last gasp of government as we once knew it. If my colleagues and I are to be executed, let it be done mercifully and in a lawful manner. Decades from now, long after the government has fallen, the United States of America will remain as a population of citizens who are striving to thrive in the wilderness, much as our ancestors did. Is that Victoria? What succeeds the present must be That's built upon principles Penn of freedom Glendale, the president. and oh. the rule of law. I believe that you are uniquely suited to the task of leading the way. I don't think we're going to no get matter Victoria. what you choose to do, know that I am grateful for your consideration and stand in admiration of what you have achieved while so many have found it. Your obedient servant, Pennington Glendale, President of the United States of America. I wanted to hear how she did uh, Victoria. Well, that's all you're going to get out of that. Oh, well, I mean, that's a good, that's a good sampling, though. Uh, but that was her, that was her male voice. That was her, what she was reading was. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's, it, it even when males do female voice, it's a little awkward. I mean, the first book you that can't I just do it, you know, yeah. The, the first book that I listened to um, on audio that I really paid attention to was, uh, is one of Jack Carr's. I can't remember which one it was, but the guy that does his, um, his books. And then when he did the first female voice, I was just like, it just completely got me out of it. I was like, <laughs> I'm pi I'm picturing a guy in drag <laughs> do, do, doing the part. So <laughs> it took me out of it a little bit. So I had to get used to it. A little bit. It. That'll do it. Yeah. Yeah. That Again, that's why I want, I want each character to have their own voice actor. So for the female characters, I want a voice Done by a female, you know, kind of deal. I will, I will pass along your desires, and I can't the be the movie. only one, you know. I'm sure, I'm sure, but you know, everybody's got to be paid. I know, I know. And then cost of books go up, and then yeah, I get it, I get it. You got to pay for what you want, but I think there's a market for it. I think you, you know, should you can be going to the production business. I'm, I'm new, in, I'm in the production thing. business. Yeah. <laughs> Even though I don't know how to hit record on my own uh, <laughs> my own productions. What a bonehead, man. I'm sorry about that again. Uh, so for you that are watching this, uh, the whole first half didn't get recorded. Of course, my bad. Uh, we could go do a take two if you wanted to on that. I don't think we could. That was pretty, that was pretty it was wide good. ranging the, and free roaming. The audio is going to be good. The audio will be right on, Clark. So talk about... The new, the harm's way. So talk about John, Jonathan Graves. Grave. I always say Graves. Jonathan Graves. Grave. Um, by way I had of background, a buddy Jonathan whose last Grave. name was Graves. That's why I say Graves. Oh, my bad. Well, and I'll tell you, his name is kind of an accident because when I first started the series, I had no idea. I, I knew I wanted to be a series, but we're 15 books into it now. There's no way I thought it would go that long. And God That's bless amazing. you readers for doing that. Yeah. But my thought was <clears throat> there'd be continuing titles. So it'd be like Grave Danger, Grave Peril, Grave, you know, that sort of thing. Right. And which in retrospect would have been a terrible idea. <laughs> but that's also why he's Jonathan Grave, not Jonathan Graves. <clears throat> it's also one of those things that hopefully it makes people think twice, you know, that it, it's more memorable than, but anyway, yeah. that's, that's authors thinking too much. In, um, in harm's way, Jonathan is um, asked by the director of the FBI to go and rescue one hostage that has been taken by the cartels. And it's a part of a missionary uh, group, uh, 10 missionaries, Baptist missionaries from Texas that are helping people drill a well or drill wells in, in, in um, these impoverished areas of, of Venezuela. And they are taken prisoner by uh, the cartel. Mm hmm and being held for hostage. And the director of the FBI asks Jonathan to go and rescue one hostage in particular. 
She doesn't want to tell him why, but of course he insists that she do. And it turns out that he, the one hostage, is an important witness in a case that she's building against the president of the United States, who is um, uh, Tony Darman. Uh, Anthony Darman has been president of the United States now, I think, for almost 20 years as in, within the, the book universe. <laughs> and, um, and when Jonathan goes over, you know, he's not going to rescue one. He's going to rescue them all because, you know, that's, that's what he does. And when he's there, he discovers that the administration – uh, has is so dirty and are uh, so vulnerable to foreign assets that the Russians actually are installing nuclear capability in Venezuela that with launch capability to the United States, sort of a repeat of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Yeah, and with full knowledge that if what if these can become operational, President Darman won't have the the cojones to to do anything about it. Right. So it would just change the balance of power in the Western hemisphere. So that's kind of the, the underpinnings of, uh, of the book. And they, you know, it's, it's a thriller. So a lot of things go wrong. Some things go right. And, um, and we get a lot of gunplay in this one, a lot of gunplay, okay. a lot of gunplay. Okay. And, and what, uh, what are, what are his weapons of choice? Can we talk about, is that going to give you sure. away? Jonathan's an H and K purist. So he he's the um, he carries a 416 within the modified M27 um, uh, Marine Corps version, and Boxers does the, the the big 417 in 762 because Boxers is his. I've never actually said how tall he is, but um, he's big. He's okay. like like Sasquatch big. Yeah. And, like a six um, three, six five kind of deal. Or? Oh, six eight, six, six eight. Ten. Okay, yeah, nice. I mean, he's he's a big boy. He's a Charlie Melton. And yeah, I mean, it's, it, I say things like he makes linebackers look puny. <laughs> it's that that kind of kind of description. Okay, nice. But he's massively strong. I like that you don't put a you know he's six foot whatever because that leads it to people's imaginations and then they can. Which is an, a key element, actually. I mean, this isn't a writing class, but I'll, I'll throw it out anyway. Um, it's a mistake for writers to get to, I think, for writers to get really specific in descriptions because readers are going to see what readers want to see anyway. Mm -hmm. So when you start getting into the into the re real details, I don't think readers are reading it. And anymore. then when you make so a movie, your book turns into a movie or TV series, then cats out of the bag then that's what all people see at that point well yeah but i mean tom cruise and was never jack reacher right i mean jack reacher is the that enormous guy yeah um the the tv series the prime series jack reacher is the he's he's about right i think how like, the author intended him to actually look yes yeah yes. That, that's what i've heard yeah yeah um but Lee Child made a lot of money from Tom Cruise for Tom Cruise to be. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure, you know, he, I'm sure he, he did not argue. Yeah. You know, he's like, hell yeah. <laughs> Tom Cruise. <I'm> like, okay. <laughs> Just it's interesting. I hear from readers who always want to cast the movie and they want to know how I would cast the movie of my books. And I don't okay. think that way. It was actually Jonathan Grave. I see in my head as the guy he's actually based off of, which is a Delta operator buddy of mine. I met when I was writing um, six minutes to freedom, but what I hear from readers, younger readers see him as, you know, one of the young actors, one of the Ryans or one of the Chris's that are in, in pop culture. Yeah. Older readers see him as they always remember Bruce Willis to be. Bruce in, Willis. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, so if I just want to stay out of the way of people's imaginations when it, when it comes to that. That's smart. Thing. Yeah, it's smart. But then, like I said, but once you hit the, and you, you have, your books have movie options. Some some of those have been purchased. The rights yes, have the been purchased. To been. Oh, they haven't? Yeah, okay. No, none of the grave books. But I've done 28 books um, over the years. So some yeah. of the early ones, uh, Nathan's Run was was purchased outright, as was at all costs. Um, then Scott Free was optioned. Um, what else was? Six Minutes to Freedom was optioned. Um and then I've written four screenplays for Hollywood, and none of those have made it to the, <laughs> to the screen either. I'm the kiss of death. Here's, what are they waiting on? It. It's like, come on, guys. I know. I know. What Get out of the way. On? Make a movie. They just haven't found that perfect actor yet. That, right. That captures the essence of your character. Um, 
But you said that Jonathan was based on a military friend of yours, Delta team guy. Yeah, there was uh, Six Minutes to Freedom is a book, uh, the nonfiction book I wrote about the rescue of Kurt Muse uh, out of um, Modelo Prison and the invasion of Panama in 1989. Yeah, a real occurrence. And, actually, I'm sorry, happened. I said I was just our listeners. That's a real occurrence that actually happened. That is a real occurrence, and it was a huge um, success for Delta Force. In fact, their first they had, they had some bad years. Uh, Grenada was really bad to them. And obviously, uh, Desert One, the Iranian hostage yeah. rescue was a total freaking disaster. And <clears throat> so James Sutterth was the guy who um, actually blew the door off Kurt's cell and got him out of the, and all that. It's just a, a really, really great guy. And I can, his, his name is James Nelson, I think, in the book, because he was still with the unit when I wrote it. And, um, so here, a you know, tragic story. He retired and I think he was 40 in his forties watching a football game and died of a heart attack. Oh, the, the real guy did the real guy, the real James, James Sutter. Uh, is that his name? Sutter? Sutter. S U D D E R T H. Um, rest his soul. He was really, really a, a good guy, a, a real patriot and, and a lot of fun and just such a, a tragic way to go. I mean, he was in Mogadishu. He did the, um, it was, just, it was, uh, just so, is, so that's who I see. Is one when of those I, when him? I read Jonathan Grave, that's who I see. The pictures that I, is, is one of those him? Uh, man, it's really hard to tell. Uh, let me pull that up. Oh, there he is down. Oops. Oh, not that one. Scroll down to the green beret guy. That's him. This guy on the, that's him. Okay. Gotcha. So and he died watching a football game, just like a heart attack yeah. or something. Yep. Man, you just never know, right? Right. James Nelson Sutter. Right. That was nice of you to pull that up. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I just, I wanted to get an idea cause I, I haven't ever read anything about him. So this is going to, get me into wanting to read that book. Well, now. that's the thing about uh, Delta. Um, I don't want to hurt any feelings here or anything, but you, you don't, there are, there are some special forces operations, special forces groups that you hear a lot about. They get a lot of publicity. You'd be hard pressed to find a, I did that memoir from a Delta guy. Right. Yeah. They're the, the true silent professionals. Mm hmm. That you hear so much about. Um, I was just going through a few more pictures. I, that's him right there too. Well, that's that's a very young him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that's that's before I knew him. Yeah, was he was he in Vietnam? Oh, uh, I see that old. I don't think so. I think he was that old. Okay. No. Gotcha. All right, I guess so, he could have been. I so that's kind of who him. you based. Your, yes, your character. That's, that's Jonathan in my mind. You okay. know what? I've never revealed that before until right here. Oh, should I edit that out? <laughs> no, no, no. Okay. It's, I mean, his family knows, but sure, um, sure. So, and a lot of other guys that. Um, and you've been writing the John... Larry Vickers. Larry, Larry Vickers? Vickers was on that raid. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Yeah, and he's in his own trouble right now. Hopefully, he's, yeah. He's I doing hope that okay. all works out. Yeah, I do too. He's a good guy. He doesn't deserve he that. Definitely not. So, um, this is your, is this your 15th Jonathan Grave novel? Yes. Yeah. Wow. Um, 15. Okay. And it, are they sequential or not are really. they standalones? I, I write them as standalones. Okay. Um, it, more like episodic television, you know, where you get the same cast of characters doing every, different things with, with each book. Yeah. Uh, the last few. Kind of like a Magnum some, P.I.? Well, okay. Kind of okay. like a Magnum guess, Well, because cool each cars. of those were, I mean, occasionally they would have some that would, you know, fall into, but right. a lot of them they just pick up and, you know, a week later or, you know, whatever. Well, the Zero Sum, which is the yellow cover I told you not to click on because there's nothing there yet. Yes. Yeah. I just finished the manuscript. Um, that is, that evolves directly from Harm's Way. It exists on its own. You can read it on its own, but the 
those two stories are pretty well linked together. And then that sets up a new series that I'm going to start. Actually, I've already started writing it. it won't come out until 2025. And that stars um, Irene Rivers, who's the director of the FBI in the Grave books. So, yeah, that's that book comes out in August. And the Zero Sum, that's another Jonathan. Jonathan. That's another Jonathan. And that's coming Grave out one. this year? Uh, that comes out, yes, in August. Wow. When do you have time to do anything else? So you're writing, this is the second one this year that's coming out for the Jonathan Grave. Well, the last one came out, Jonathan Grave came out in um, September. Okay. Well, I mean, still. So, yeah. Yeah. So there's a Jonathan Grave book every year. And then. So you're doing one a year, dropping one a year. Right. Except with the new contract I just signed, it'll be for four more books. I'm going to writing a book every nine months as opposed to every six months. So yeah. the Jonathan's will drop every 18 months and then the new Irene books will be every 18 months. So tell but us about new... the Irene. Irene Rivers is the, um, it, within the story, within the book, the only honest bureaucrat in Washington. I mean, she's, she's a girl scout and, but she has her foibles. I mean, she, she, um, She's hired Jonathan to do a lot of things that are outside the law, but always on the side of the angels, right? Always in sure. the interests of justice. Sure. And she ultimately, uh, kind of a spoiler alert, I guess, in zero sum, she brings down the Darman administration. They are so dirty and so corrupt. And again, I wrote this. Um, his son-in-law is, and this was set up, you have to believe me, like a dozen years ago in, in an earlier book, right. his son-in-law is selling access to the White House through um, his, his he's leveraging his father's or his father-in-law's name um, by way of perpetuating an open border, which keeps the flow of uh, narcotics, which is very lucrative to the government bureaucrats who are allowing this to happen and making money off of it as a result. Right. So that's, that's the conspiracy. Which again, the, that's why they allow all these things that you're questioning. It's like, why are they allowing it? Cause they're making money off of it in real life. Follow the money. Yeah. That was the, what was that deep throat during the uh, Watergate years? Follow yeah. the money. Yeah. And I don't know. I'm not saying that that's what's happening in real life. Right it now. is. I'm saying that's we're what not, happens. We're not naive. Life. We're not stupid. Okay. We know I, that I would that's, agree. I just that don't. that's what's happening. They I are making too far money out of my skis. because you take these people that go in for the first time, take these uh, higher political or any political office for that matter, and they come out, you know, they go in thousandaires and they come out multimillionaires. Something. And they paid $4 million on their campaign to get there. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Where's this money going? Going into their bank accounts. All this money that's going to UK Ukraine and Israel, it's not all going there. <laughs> it's it's not. Well, it's not. Well, it, all right. How how so within the con, within the constructs of my books? Sure. Here's how it happens. Sure, sure, sure. That well placed politicians make sure that lucrative government contracts go to the companies that have that are located in the politician's district and have made sure that the politician is well taken care of in that district in order to get the contract. So it's all, and if you look at a president's candidate, certainly President Darman's um, cabinet, not candidate, look at his cabinet, they're all big donors and longtime friends mm -hmm. who are running the um the the whole country you know, making policies complex and everything making else. policies yeah that's, right so yeah. that's what irene rivers exposes and brings down at the price of everything i mean it destroys her career and, and has significant complications on her life in zero sum and so as she leaves washington in disgrace she moves to wait for it the eastern panhandle of west virginia <laughs> <laughs> where <laughs> she she sinks roots and tries to remain invisible, but uh, it doesn't work all that well. I don't want to steal – there's a question that we've got from one of the listeners, and I'll read that in a minute, so I don't want to steal his his question. But, yeah, keep going. No, that's it. I mean, so, so she – in the new series, which I've just barely started, about 2,000 words into it, which is, you know, 15 pages, um, 
she's trying to remain invisible, you know, just kind of try to start over again. Right. But it life doesn't let that happen. So this is a spin-off character from one of the Jonathan Graves. Yes. Series. So she's going to have right. her own series. Have her own series. Okay. But she was first introduced in a book. Actually, you see it on my shoulder at all costs. Um, she was an FBI agent. Hold that up. In that book, which came out in 1998. Uh, it's it's behind glass, off. kind of a pain in the ass to get to. Oh, uh, okay. Oh, it's in glass. Okay, that's why. I was like, there's a glare or something on there. So. Yeah. Um, speaking, I'll just go to... I, I made a post. I don't know if you saw it. I tagged you in it. Um, I meant for you to reshare it, but so you, your listeners could, oh. could also ask questions. But um, all I see is me. I, it's on Instagram. I did it on Instagram. Oh, okay. Um, I'll show it to you. I'll pull up Instagram because I have that capability nowadays. I can I can share my screen. I'm high tech anymore. High tech redneck from Tennessee. <laughs> uh, it's refreshing. There now it's up. Am I still sharing the uh, the screen on here? No, let me go here. I see you and me. Oh, there we go. Yep, there there's go. Amazon. Yeah, there's Amazon. I'm gonna switch it. Hopefully, it'll switch there too. Let's see. Did he go to Instagram now? Is it still Not on, on Amazon? my screen? Is it still on Amazon? Yeah. Okay. I'll have to share a different technology. Streamyard. I'm using it's called StreamYard, John. It, just got to get to know it. All right, share screen, video, share screen. Here we go. And then you can like pick which tab you want. I thought I did a really good job on this. So. You see it now? Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Thank you for using the old picture. <laughs> well, you, I liked it because you were just kind of like, I don't give a fuck. Kind of look. So anyway, this is the post I made. And I did it. I did it late yesterday, and my apologies. I tried to get them out sooner, but I was at the range all weekend, so. Um, we got, we've got a question and it's from Jerry Black and it's a good question. He's got like a, a, a multi-part question here. It says, where do I start? I think he's wanting to get into, uh, to several questions with that. Is there any chance six minutes to freedom will ever have a screenplay? That's part one. I'll okay. Let you, I'll let you do that one. Uh, well, <laughs> Will there ever be a screenplay? There have been multiple screenplays. Um, last I heard, the project was alive, but um, looks nothing like Six Minutes to Freedom. It's actually doesn't even feature Kurt Muse in it anymore. It's kind of a, a television series. It's based on State Department people. Um, so I haven't I haven't read any of that script. That's been in operation. The f the first. First option I took on that was 2006, I think. Yeah. And they've been re-upping it ever since. So okay. they're, they're paying for the rights, but they, to my knowledge, they haven't produced Taking um, a workable screenplay. So I don't know. That's the vagaries of Hollywood. And they haven't asked you to come in and, and help do anything? Oh, I wrote the first version. Well, <laughs> I when I sold the rights to the, uh, when I sold the option, I attached myself as a screenwriter because I've done screenplays before. And frankly, I wanted to get back in the union and they have good health programs and that kind of stuff. And you get screeners at award season. Yeah. Um, and then it just kind of limped along. And then finally they found a producer to invest the real money and they're going to take the next step. And they paid me my quote. They paid me what they would pay me to write a screenplay, not to write the screenplay. So I'll I don't really it. understand <laughs> why they would do that. Literally the easiest money I've ever made. Um, mm -hmm. But they 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 paid me what I would have taken a, you know six months to write. Yeah, and not write. I mean, anything. it's hard to turn that down. It I is guess. hard to turn that down. The Keltec Sub 2000 is a name and firearm platform synonymous with innovation. This year, we're looking forward to welcoming even more to the fold 
with a twist. The new Sub 2003 takes kel iconic folding carbine to the next level. By allowing you to leave affixed optic, lights, sights, or other accessories on the firearm, even when it's folded away. To fold the carbine for storage, press down on the trigger guard while pulling back on the end. Rotate or twist the forend until the side slot on the leading end snaps into the retention latch on the buttstock. To unfold the carbine into the firing position, press the latch release button on the end of the buttstock and pull the forend up and away while rotating or twisting it until the forend engages with an audible snap into the back half of the carbine. Compact and ready for use, the Sub-2003 weighs in unloaded at 4.2 pounds, with a compact folded length of 16.15 inches and an overall length of 30.45 inches when unfurled for use. From the backcountry to personal protection, this versatile go-anywhere tack driver is the perfect multi-purpose addition to any collection. Innovation. Performance. kel -Tec. Let's see, his second question is, and that, when you were talking about, you know, the new character, Irene, that you're bringing in, and her mm -hmm. being in West Virginia, that's what made me think. I was like, oh, he's, he's got the question here similar. Is it challenging keeping Jonathan Grave, see, he, he, he put Graves on there too. Okay, that's all right. <laughs> People do that. I get that a lot. Jonathan Grave and Victoria Emerson work separate without sort of crossover in stories or is a crossover blend of heroes something you might consider? Which you kind of did with the... The... Um, but those two are separate worlds, me, right? Those are completely different worlds. Well, all of my books at this point share some DNA yeah. and I've worked to do that. Uh, you really, really, really got to struggle to find it. The... Uh, the basic quite to get to the heart of his question, no, they're entirely different uh, characters doing different things in different times. But I do the um, the journalist who cre who leaked the story that that started the nuclear war is a senior Bob Woodward kind of guy for a, from a, a fictional newspaper in Washington, um, and he was first introduced in. Um, one of the early grave books. There it is. High treason it was first introduced in high treason as sort of a cub reporter. So there is, there, there is some shared DNA with, uh, with all of the books, but they're separated by years. And, uh, but the characters and, and what they do are entirely different in my head. Yeah. The, the more difficult challenge along those lines will be with Irene rivers because we've only known her through the interaction with Jonathan Grave in the stories. And now she's the star of her own series and Jonathan Grave really can't be a part of it because of the way it all comes, the, the zero sum ends. They really can't, they can't see each other again. Right. And there's never been a romance there, but um, so Irene will have to live a different life. So is Irene a, now gotta build a, a younger, sorry? I was gonna say, is Irene a younger character? I don't know how old Irene is. I know okay. she's got teenage children. My characters don't age. Okay. And I also don't assign them an age. Okay. Which gets back to... Well, you said that Jonathan and, and she haven't had a romance. So I was like, they're the same around the same age or something. I would guess. Yeah. You know, well, she was director of the FBI. So is she you hot? So you have a certain age to get there. Is, is she, she hot? Jonathan it, thinks she is. Okay. But TV cameras don't like her. <laughs> the TV so cameras don't like her. Okay. She doesn't come off well... On, on television, but Jonathan okay. thinks she's hot. I've seen some beautiful women that um, don't translate to TV, and I've seen some beautiful women on TV that you see them in person. You're like, ooh. <laughs> One comes to yeah, mind right now, and I certainly won't mention her name, but... Um, Julia Roberts? <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> um, she's a, a news Take lady um, who's gorgeous on camera, and then when you see her in person, it's like, ooh. It, yeah, like it, makeup is troweled on, you know, it's, it's just that, uh, it works on the screen. Right. Not so much yeah, face to face, but she's delightful. Delightful sure. lady. I enjoy her. Company. Sure. 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 I get it. No, I was just, uh, I was just curious as for when you said the romance wasn't there. Um, 
But you 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 have two strong female characters now, two lead female characters. What? Mm-hmm. I don't know how to ask this question. Why why would you go female character? Well, in the case of Victoria, you're a Emerson, male. I mean, you're a male, so I, mean, I am. I am. And, and how do you and come from with, a female with the pronouns to go with it? I'll have you know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, with Victoria, it had to be that way. I mean, she's a single mom, and you know, there's just that was the way the the character evolved. Yeah. And with um, Irene, she's always been who she is. I think when I made her director of the FBI in the first grave book, which was No Mercy, she's kind of a throwaway character. Yeah. I needed to have a director of the FBI, and I realized, oh, yeah, I used her back in at all costs. I'll just make her FBI director now. And then the more I, I worked with her and they worked together, she just became this sort of force of nature sort of character in the grave books. Sure. And with Victoria kind of having run her course for the time being, and frankly, you know, fe- strong female characters bring a lot of extra readers that I otherwise wouldn't have. Sure. No, I get it. I get yeah. it. It's just, uh, it's so that's just, where it comes from. I never set out to say I want to create a, a strong female character. Who do you draw just, from, I guess, maybe to get the personalities, to get the, to get the responses and the, you know, the, I guess the interaction. Who, who do you draw from female wise to, I have no to idea. Create your female characters. I don't really, I don't really write that way. I don't, um, even, even when it comes down to James uh, being the, the, uh, Jonathan Grave character, that's a physicality thing. It's not a, yeah. um, but to get mannerisms and, you know, speech, I don't know what the, the word I'm looking for, but the way a female, I mean, I couldn't do that. I was like, I, it would be like, so this chick would be a dude. <laughs> I mean, the way she would act or the way she would talk or, because I don't know how women talk. I don't know how women, you know, do things. So I mean, there's got to be some research that you go that you put into it to to bring the feminism, I guess, to the character. Maybe that's a better way to say it. I figure I'm not saying you're feminine at all because I mean, no, you're no, no, a, no, no, no. I, you're I, a I firefighter. Exactly look, look, listeners. He's a firefighter. He's an explosives <laughs> expert. I mean, he's as as manly as you can get. So I Wrong. just, how do you draw? You know, how do you bring in a female character, I guess? Um, I write a character who happens to be female. They, I don't write about her womanness any more than I write about Jonathan's manness. Right. It, they're just characters. Um, you love your family. I mean, I think it's at least in, in, in my world, my real world, I think um, my I love... Do you have sisters? My son as much as my no, no sisters. No. Okay. Now, what you will never see me writing, and well, I shouldn't say never because never is a long time. Um, <laughs> I'm very uncomfortable writing younger female characters. Okay, where they're all, they're all angsty, and you know, no. I, I, that makes me really uncomfortable because I can slide very quickly into cliche, where I could you know inadvertently insult people. Yeah, you know, I don't. You're waving a book at me. I, I, I don't want to forget. I want to ask you. I'm going to I'm going to compare that to. Do you know who Jim Shockey is? I do not. So Jim Shockey um, is like the outdoor big game hunting um, god. You know, he's got all kinds of shows on all the outdoor channels, and you know he's been doing it for for decades and decades and decades. And mm-hmm. he wrote his first um, fiction novel. It's called Call Me Hunter. And it has nothing to do with what you think it would be, like actual, you know, big game hunting and stuff like that. But he's got his is a strong female character, one of the lead roles, and they're younger. And he's older. He's older than you and I. He's an older gentleman. Mm -hmm. Um, but I mean, I ask him, you know, the same thing. But he's got a daughter. You know, he's got a a daughter, and he grew up, and and I can kind of see where he could pull. The and he nailed like these younger characters, their personalities, and you know the way they would talk and you know do things is the way you would imagine a, a, a girl that age to do stuff. But that I guess that's the reason why I'm because he's another guy writing about a. I was like, how do you, how do you put yourself in into the female 
perspective, I guess. I don't know. It's just, it's just hard for me to. I think it's more a matter of regulating where I don't go. Yeah. With a female character. Um, I would certainly never, ever, ever will we be in Irene's bedroom, for example. Sure. You know, with, with it just, it's just romance kind I mean, of deal. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't. Not going down that road. <laughs> I'm not going down that road because I don't understand well, that side of that exactly, road. Right? Exactly. That's what and, I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, so, and Irene's always been, in, in her case, she's always been in charge of her world. She's the director of the freaking FBI. When, when she says stand up, people jump. Yeah. So, you know, her, her worldview is, um, is universal. It's, it's neither, neither masculine nor feminine. And I, and I think that we're, where women go wrong writing men characters and, and where men go Vice wrong versa. writing women's characters is it has nothing to, it's with the choices they make to go the, the one step further than they should. Yeah. It's like people who write about Yankees who write about Southern, <laughs> you know, it's, they're always, they're always going to be, um, stereotypes, a little bit on the stupid side of things, you know, which is their cliche. Yeah. And I'm sure it goes the other way too. You know, right. Um, if I write about a Californian, I'll make them a little more granola eating probably than they really are. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, it's, it's when you, if you stay in the lane of humanity, but can you do that? Is that possible to make a Californian a little more granola than they already are? It's, <laughs> I just don't think it's possible. I don't know. It's, I don't know why anybody stays in California. Getting back to the previous conversation, how many different ways can you tell people what they can't do? Yeah. I, I just don't understand that. Yeah. And then, and then they leave and then they come to, oh, let's just say Murfreesboro, Tennessee, and they move in next to, oh, let's say me. And they try to change everything back to the what they just left. You know, it's like, why? Just go back. You know, it's, I, I read a, a news story. I'm going to get the details wrong, but it was about within whatever the last week was of, of immigrants coming to the United States. And it was the the top five countries. And, and I know one of them was the um, Republic of Congo, I think. Sure. And there's more of them than, than you would think. And, but of the 1600 uh, immigrants from that week, one came to West Virginia. <laughs> and then, you know, all of the others are going to, a lot went to New York, obviously into LA and, yeah. and other people. Chicago. It, yeah. Chicago. You don't see a lot of, uh, you don't see a lot of people migrating into West Virginia. Where yeah, they don't seem to migrate to the colder northern no. states. They like to stay that's in the just warmer southern. Fine. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, they don't need to be coming here uh, the way they're coming here. I, I have nothing against people coming here immigrating legally mm -hmm. um, and going through the proper process. I mean, my neighbors, I've got some neighbors that uh, they've been here longer than I've been alive. And they came from, um, um, they're not Mexican. They, they want you to know that. Like, okay. We are not Mexican. Um, uh, where did they come from? I can't remember exactly, but Guatemala would be my next guess. That's, it's not, uh, it's not, it's not Guatemala. It, uh, but anyway, they've been here, like I said, longer than I've been alive. He was a school teacher in the school system and he taught and, you know, they're retired now. And, you know, they're they're the prime example of immigrating to America the proper way and then living the dream that you want to do. You know, they right. worked for it. You know, they pulled themselves up from their bootstraps and they didn't take government handouts and uh, they learned the language and they spoke the language and didn't expect people to to cater to them, kind of deal. Yeah, you know? which is what the American dream has always been. It's always it's the been. opportunity to well, excel. But it's that's not what it is these days. I mean, it's still the American dream, but the American dream is is changing because the government and these liberals, and well, I'm gonna say liberal socialists, have infiltrated the system, and they want to just give everything away nowadays. But enough politics. Let's let's quit talking politics. And, okay. Um. So that was our Jerry Black. So thank you, Jerry, for for doing that and. Uh, if we get some questions later on after we do this recording, um, I'll be sure to pass them on to John. But what's what's one of the most common questions that you get from your readers? 
from from the readers themselves. Yeah, when, um, when you go travel around, you do your book signings, you do your promotions. Um, I'm sure you get hit up with emails and social media stuff too all the time. What's what's one you see you, more frequently than others? Most of the, most of the emails and such I get are from aspiring writers yeah. who want to know, you know, how how to get started. What, where's the magic unicorn to to make all of this happen? Where do ideas come from? That sort of thing. Those those are the most common. In terms of um, plot issues, I hear from a lot of people, and again, not to go back into politics, but President Darmond has been in office since at least 2007, right? It's when I wrote the first book. And people read books that are, you know, go back that far and then and hammer me because I'm making fun of the the Biden administration or the Trump administration or the Obama administration. It depends on when they're reading it sure. because they assume that that the reality of the book is the reality of of the yeah, time. They, of course, it, yeah. it's um, most recently the one that really <laughs> I don't usually engage in those letters. I say thank you for for reading and just just let it go. Sure, but it was a they were went on and on about my hatred for the. Biden administration and how insulting I was. And it was a book that I had written in 2010. So <laughs> it's <laughs> you're like, how is that? Possible? Yeah. Yeah. You got to look at that front page, dude. It's that's yeah, an important bit of information. That's what you should do is just put the, the date and then say, Oh, just scan a copy. Still feel the- this way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You still feel this way. <laughs> kind of, but that's something that uh, I've noticed too, with a lot of the authors that I've had on, is their ability to, to, even though at the time this hasn't happened, you know, it's not even a, a thought in anybody's mind, but then, you know, when the book comes out or maybe a few years after the book has been out, it happens, you know, kind of deal. And it's like, where do you guys get, get this insight, you know? And, and I think it has to do with your, your awareness of, what's going on currently you're you know you take your past you take your present experiences uh you do your research for one you know mm-hmm. you've got sources that you go to i know that you, know, you introduced me to to jeff and uh you know you rely on him on some of the weapon stuff i know you know right that's that's no secret no surprise um but it just it, i think that subconsciously you're like, all right, if this continues to happen, this is kind of the road we're headed down. And then what would happen if this, and then that becomes reality because what would happen happens because you're like, mm-hmm. if we continue down this road because we keep continuing down this road. We are like, we don't get off this road. And you know, there's been so many indicators. There's like, if we keep going down this road, then, you know, Victoria Emerson is going to happen. You know, that's going to be our reality in 20 years from now or less. Well, so, I certainly hope not, <clears throat> but well, it's going to take we certainly some adult not. intervention. Yeah. To, to keep her from going there. You know, I find I, I love to, I happen to know a lot of people, some through the books and some through just through life. I'm kind of a gregarious guy, type a personality. I meet everybody that I know, or, you know, I, I meet everybody that I run into. Um, Hi, how are you? And there are a lot of spooky people in this part of the world where I've always lived. And, you know, whether they're NSA or FBI or CIA or, you know, any of the alphabet agencies, um, you know, I never, ever would ask anybody to to share a national secret. I don't want to know. I used to. I was back to used to be in that business. It was a burden I didn't like. But I frequently ask, so what's the thing that scares you the most? especially for recent retirees. Uh, what was the thing that scared you the most, the scenario? And they know what I do for a living. Yeah. Um, and you, and you hear a lot from that, uh, in zero sum, the, the book that comes out in August, one of the guys I talked to, and again, it goes back to AI. There's a new swarm technology for drones where tiny drones, keep, they have, um, it's like a, a they swarm. They have the same same programming, and you could, for example, this doesn't, as purported to me, doesn't exist yet, but it's it's on the, it's 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 coming. Yeah, you could program 
a swarm of little drones with a tiny little explosive charge, whatever, yeah. whatever's the weapon you want to use sure. to go onto a college campus and target everybody who likes Betty Jones on Facebook. And then they will go and they, and yeah. seek them out until the battery have runs a out. Poisonous agent or, you know, whatever, it, yeah, whatever it could be. And I, I that's thought, not and beyond I the that. realm of, I mean, I, I've, Totally, I think it exists right now. I think they can do that right now. Well, and more and more, you know, you're we we never are not photographed anymore. Yeah. Um, and, and so it's if as a thriller writer, I think a writer in general, but certainly when I write, I'm just predisposed to run in these directions with with my head. And if it's if it's feasible, then you know, if all I have to do is convince the reader that it, that it's doable. Yeah. And if I can think of it, then any bad guy or any good guy can think of the same thing. Yeah. That's I the way I am. It's time. like, if I've thought of it, it's probably already out there. You know, it, right. It's like, I'm sure I'm behind the curve by a millennium. In one of the early grave books, I got a, uh, a very angry phone call from a, um, one of the spooky guys that, that I talked to and he just, he let me have it and said, <laughs> damn it, John, you promised you weren't going to share this stuff and that is a bit of technology, satellite technology that I, that I put in the book. Yeah. And I said, well, Steve, um, you didn't tell me this. I made it up, but thank you. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> uh, but you know, if it's a way to track somebody or kill somebody or get money from somebody, if I can think of it, there is a top secret development program at CIA for it. Exactly. That's what I, that's the way I think It's like, Oh, I guarantee this already exists. There's, right. there's somebody doing this, but I mean, we hear about the drones. That's like the big news nowadays is just everything's drone, drone, drone. Even the, you know, the Iranians have the drone, you know, technology. Mm-hmm. They, they're using it against Israel and vice versa. Israel's using it uh, on them. But Well, uh, the Houthis just used it against the, you know, in, in Yemen, just killed a bunch of yeah. Americans last week with them. Exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, it's out there. It exists. It's And it's only going to progress and continue and. Uh, but the fact, you know, my point that because you guys are in the know and you do get to have these conversations with the, you know, the secret um, silent types and uh, it, it gets your imagination going. So they tell you something, and you're like, oh, well, what if it continued down this road? Then, you know, and that and right. it does continue down that road. And just like that guy, get you got that cranky call from the guy saying, hey, dude. What are you doing? You're like, well, you didn't tell me about that. Um, I just came up with that on my own through previous conversations, you know, so. Right. Kind of stuff. But I I just think it's amazing because I've just, I've read so many books, you, Jack Carr, Brad Thor, you know, it's like this, you know, how do you, how did you know this was going to happen? Kind of doing, they're they're the same answer. You know, Brad was part of that Red Cell, I think it's called Red Cell program. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, Yes. The, the CIA, FBI, and he was talking about that when I had him on. And um, is that, have you ever been approached by a government agency or to, to be a part of one of those think tank operations no, that they put together? No, I have together? not. I have not. But I would think, you know, writing, Brad and I kind of write in the same sleeve of, of thrillerdom. I think the challenge, I've never spoken to him about this, but I would think the challenge for him is much more difficult than for me because he actually was there and he actually knows stuff. Yeah. All I do is make stuff up. So for him, I would think he'd have to really walk a very fine line. Yeah, that's what he said. What, he said that any of that stuff that they discussed or talked about is like it's off limits. He cannot, he cannot write about it. Um, if there's something that he wants to, he has to ask. You know, obviously get the permission. And I think he said they've only given him permission one time to talk about an incident that happened that he was a part of the mm-hmm. the think tank that that happened there so yeah that would be very challenging because all you know all your great ideas are you know you can't use them <laughs> because you were part of it kind of deal so but he well, seems to be doing okay. is if, if i write about it and i get it wrong he can't tell me it's wrong so that's right <laughs> <laughs> or if you got it right they can't tell you yeah unless they do it inadvertently and call you and start cussing you <laughs> right then you're like ah gotcha <laughs> So uh, you went to SHOT Show. I did. 
Talk about, in our previous episode that I did, uh, we had some people on that attended and we talked about, you know, some things that they saw that they liked and were innovating, caught their eye, you know, kind of stuff. Um, I wanted to ask you the same thing. So as you were there, were you there the whole week or just a couple of days? I was, yeah, Monday through Friday. Okay. I was going to leave on Thursday, but I, the flights got all screwed up. So I ended up staying through the, uh. Did the you, whole thing. Did you uh did you and Jeff run around again together or was it We literally ran into each other. Okay. Like, turning a corner and, and and bumped in. Uh Jeff Gonzalez, I presume. Jeff Gonzalez, yeah, former Navy yeah. SEAL. Um, yeah. Great guy. And um he's actually he, I don't know what the right word is. I don't know what his association is with with his new um uh ammunition technology. It's called Sim X ammunition. Okay. Which is um, pistol ammunition with rifle velocities and the terminal ballistics of these things are, are pretty significant as, yeah. as he represented. I didn't, I didn't get a chance to shoot it. I, I, I don't know if they had it at range day, but I didn't see him at range day. So I didn't get actually get to shoot it, but that's pretty interesting. Okay. So um, is it, is it actual ammunition or is it simunition? Well, you know, it's interesting. I, it's real ammunition with an unfortunate name. Because it sounds like, you know, it's ammunition. Yeah. But um, it's uh, ammunition yields ultra high velocity, lo- low recoil, lower weight, and more shots on target. So it's um, pistol, pistol caliber ammo, but with rifle velocities. Right. Huh. Which then, you know, you, you get the much larger permanent can- cavity on impact. That's all velocity driven, right? Yeah. Um, and Range. it weighs significantly less. They had a, a box of regular nine millimeter and a box of the, the, um, Simex nine millimeter. It's really, it feels like half. Huh? Uh, so I don't understand the technology. I know that there's, there's polymer technology that's, that's involved. And, and Jeff but, is involved with the company that's doing this. Yeah. And I don't know it. I, I don't know the nature of his role, uh, whether he's, uh, fronting for it or if he's consulting on it, I don't know, but, but he introduced me to this. What's it called again? And, S I M hyphen X. Okay. Sim X. I'll look it up. Let me get them on to talk about it. That's interesting. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. That'd be great. Yeah. I'm sure they'd love to. But do you get a and, lot of um, your ideas um, by going to shot show, seeing the, yes. the different technology that's out there? It's the different technologies and playing with, with different toys. Um, night vision stuff, thermal imaging, that kind of, it's, so far out of my expertise and I, I get things that go boom and I understand the technology of things that go boom. Once you start into the, the imaging and, and um, tracking and all of that, it's, it's really, a, it's a long pull for me. Yeah. And um, I was really interested in, in looking at a lot of that stuff while I was out. Again, I don't really understand it, but it's, um, it's getting a lot more affordable. I know that. It is that as, as, the technology is um, getting better. Obviously, you know, when things, they get cheaper and there's mm-hmm. more people getting in the game, so it's more competitive. So, yeah, there's better uh, thermal night vision products coming out, uh, cheaper, better than, you know, you could have bought 10 years ago, you know, and paid $10,000 for, you know, you're probably paying sub three for, for even better technology. This, Actually, this there's days. one thermal imaging site, and I didn't, I don't have the business card here, um, but it was uh, like 800 bucks for a night site. Okay. But I also learned the difference between um, detection and recognition. Yeah. So, uh, it, and that's really important. If, if I'm, if I want to shoot a coyote in a backyard, if I see a coyote shaped thing and it's on my property, I know it's likely a coyote and I can shoot it. Yeah. If I worry about is it the coyote or the neighbor's dog, that's a different <laughs> thing, right? So yeah. uh, I thought that was that was interesting. Another interesting bit of ammo that I saw, you might want to bring them on. CCI mm-hmm. has a new 22 caliber uh, ammo. It's called Uppercut, and it is specifically designed for two to four inch barrels, and it's um, hollow point, you know, blossoming ammo with a hundred percent performance rate as they say, uh, which looking at what, again, I haven't done a deep dive on this, but it actually, their market is, it, it brings 22 caliber, you know, 22 long rifle 
pistols back into play for personal protection okay. for daily carry, yeah. which is really pretty interesting. And if you go on the CCI site and you take a look at at, at that ammo, uh, that was pretty exciting. Those are the only really there were no no breakthrough toys, you know, no no great firearms that that I saw while I was out there. Attention business owners, are you ready to take your marketing game to the next level? Look no further than Black Tie Digital Marketing, the firearm-friendly, full-service agency that delivers results. We've worked with industry giants like kel Spikes Tactical, and Armalite, and we even designed the kick-ass new logo at Talk and Lead. At Black Tie, we blend creativity and data-driven strategies to ensure your message hits the mark every time. From high-end custom websites, graphic design, to inbound marketing campaigns, and everything in between, we've got you covered. Your success is our priority. Join the ranks of the industry's top players and give your business the boost it deserves. Experience the power of Black Tie today. Visit blacktiedigital.com or call 1-800-316-8030 to schedule your free consultation. That's Black Tie Digital Marketing, where firepower meets marketing power. Black Tie Digital Marketing is a proud sponsor of the Talking Lead Podcast and the Lead Head Brigade. Are you into lever actions at all? I just bought my first lever action. I got a, a Rossi R92 triple black, 44 Magnum. Very nice. And how you like it? Haven't shot it yet. I mean, I just got it as in day before yesterday. Oh, so that, that recent. Yeah. yeah, I saw it at last year's SHOT Show. And I've been trying to get one ever since. And the Hafer's guns down the street from me finally. Actually, they had it in 357 Magnum. And then I ordered it in 44. And I it just came in. Okay. So you prefer the 44 or the 357? Because I've I've got some lever actions. Um, and they're all in 3030. And I'm thinking mm-hmm. about getting a 357 uh, lever action. So should I go 357 or 44? I, I don't know. I, I, I think... For me, again, I have a little dog and I live in a coyote area. So, you know, I want to, I, and I don't want my, my wife won't let me have um, uh, a scary black gun, you know, an AR next to the door where we take the dogs out, which sure. for me would be the ideal thing to have. Yeah. So I don't know. I think 44 is plenty enough to take out. Um, oh yeah. I mean, 44 is great. I just, I've done some research on the, you know, the ballistics of each and everything I keep coming up with is telling me to go with the 357. Um, then I would go, plus I'm the not, cost. A, I'm, I'm sorry. I said, plus the cost. Yeah. Um, 357 is a little cheaper than the, than the 44. You know, and the reason I landed on 44 Magnum, that's what I shot at last year's shot show. Was so, the 44? You know, I, okay. Yeah. I yeah. really liked it. So it's my only 44 Magnum fire. But I don't have a 357 either. So I don't have any 357s either. That would be like the only thing that I would have in 357 would be that if I get the lever action. Um, mm-hmm. But so here's the CCI you were talking about, the upper cut. Yeah. Um, yeah. Can you see? I think if you scroll down, you'll see the. Well, you can kind of see the. There it is. Yeah. You, down at the bottom. They had a bunch of examples out on on the table. So now, 30, of course, that's 22 long rifle. It looks so much bigger in the picture than it. Than it actually is. Yeah. So 32 grain jacketed hollow point bullet, um, nose skiving ensures pedals peel back for uniform consistent expansion velocity optimized for performance through semi-automatic handguns with a two and a half to four inch barrel, extremely reliable unwaxed bullet reduces fouling and improves feeding in all temperatures. So this, this will just go through your, a uh, regular 22 long handgun. Yeah, okay. right. So all the um, Keltex, the Glock that's got the 22 out, any of those will work. And I right. guess I guess well, you can you shoot go. it through rifles too, right? I don't see why. Yeah, you could shoot through a rifle also. Whatever each 22 long rifle. So I've got a couple of uh, the ARs. I just got an AK in 22. A 22, really? yeah, 22 AK. 47 from Pioneer Arms Corps. They're the sponsors of our AK corner. Uh, they're out of Poland, but they have a, they call it the 22 trainer, but it's everything's exact weight parts, except the bolt and the, you know, the magazine and all as a, as an AK. So uh, I guess they use it 
uh, for law enforcement military training uh, to train their people on. It's cheaper ammo, obviously, with the twenty two, uh, and it, it's just it's fun to shoot. I really enjoy it. You know, so everything's ideal, ideally the same as an AK forty seven. It's just in a twenty two. So that's right. the first one that I know of that that somebody's really done a a complete copy of the the AK forty seven. I just got my first suppressor. Ah, for, for a, first can. Uh, a, a a 1022, which is a lot of fun. That's oh a, yeah, and it actually didn't take as long as I thought. I think it was about six months for the ATF stamp. That's yeah, that's relatively short amount of time. The last yeah. two that I got both took over a year. Wow, for me to to get those. Um, so yeah, that's the only drawback with the the cans and. You know, again, another another one of those things that government regulation that shouldn't shouldn't be in place. I mean, cans are are something that should be required, you know, for hearing protection and just common yep. courtesy. And uh, there's and no people. I don't understand. Nobody's going out committing murders and and assassinating people. And if they are, they're doing it illegally anyway. And you're never going to know. <laughs> Yeah, you know, some of the regulations the that come out. Government agency. I understand where they're coming from. You know, if, if, if particularly if if you don't, if, if you're not into the culture and don't really know. Obviously, you know, if you have a thirty round magazine, that's that's twenty more people you can mow down than with ten. It's flawed logic. It's you just put another magazine in. You just from. put another ten magazine in. It's under, yeah, but, exactly, exactly. But a, a criminal is not going to abide by the law anyway. They're gonna right. I don't understand the the philosophy behind the suppressors. Why? Why it's a why regulated item? Yeah. yeah, it just makes no sense. To me. And it it all boils down to, according to things, everything that I've read, you know, it assassinations. If somebody gets shot or murdered, then nobody's going to hear the shot. Makes no well, sense. Yeah. Makes no sense. But now, yeah. But with the with the big boom, depends on where the shot's taken. It sounds like it comes from everywhere. You don't know where right being you know, three hundred eight shot came from. You know, it's mm -mm. somewhere over there. You know, it's yeah. But I mean, the majority of the time, anyway, when if somebody's being shot like that, there's nobody around anyway. Nobody's going to hear it anyway. Right. So I don't know. It's it's just flawed. It's it's money. It's money. It's you know. Mm -hmm. You want this? You be, you give us. Uh, you give up your rights. You give up your freedoms. You give us money, and then we'll give you the privilege. You can have the privilege of owning this, but you can't. You can't pass it down. Your your relatives can't have it. You can't give it to your son or your grandson, or because after you die, then unless you put it in a trust. Did you trust yours? Did you put yours in a trust? No, I, you know, I actually talked to the to the seller and to the, an ATF guy that was at the shot show. Yeah, that if it's a direct inheritance, like part of the estate, it's not a problem. But mm. he, my son, couldn't, as I understand it. I haven't done a deep dive on this. It won't be my problem. Um, <laughs> no, it won't. I, I, I don't think that there's there's an issue from one generation to the next. Yeah, I think there is. Yeah, I think okay. I think you can't I can't just give it or if I die they can't inherit it. It they have to turn it over to or the, that's what I understand. And I, I and that's why that they came out with the trust. Day. Yeah. That's why they came out with trust and then people started putting them in trust because of that. So, I mean, I I don't know. I'm not an attorney. I just Pretend to be one on the show. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it, and it goes to how complicated these regulations are. Nobody really understands them. They don't, and they they do that intentionally. They can mm -hmm. they they make them vague, intentionally wordy, and it's it's by design, and they do a good job with it apparently. So, um, but we uh hour and twenty two minutes plus the hour that we did. That I didn't record, <laughs> <laughs> and I know you've got things that you need to do, but I did want to get your take if, if, if there was something that that you saw that really caught your eye that you thought was innovative at at SHOT Show. So a um, couple of the ammunition things is really what caught your eye. Yeah, the ammo was the was that I, I mentioned. Those were the two breakthrough 
uh, issues. There's always kind of, um, you know, fun toys. I, I, I tend to like smaller weapons. I, yeah, I think like North American arms, you know, mini revolver stuff. I think those things are great, impractical as hell, but I just <laughs> like the engineering of it. Yeah. Um, there's a new I think It's called a billy goat. It's a, it's a 2.3 pound 22 long rifle carbine that you put, I guess, in your backpack or, uh, it was, it was fun to play with at range day. It jammed on the second shot, uh, but it was range day, you know, so sure. God knows how many hundreds of rounds went through that to that point is 22. But, um, you know, it's the kind of thing that I, I liked when I looked at it until I looked a little closer and everything's too small. The buttstock's too small, the, but the idea is good. Right. Um, so, hey, I recognize that book. Yeah. So, uh, listeners, go to John's website. It's johngillstrap.com. And he's got the new Harm's Way up top there. I'm sure you can go and can you get your books on your website? Can they order them and, and get them? Um, if you follow the links, that'll take you to bookstores where you can, where you can buy them. Okay. I don't, I don't sell directly off the website. Okay. I got you. But you, you put your latest and greatest up there. So if they want to know what's going on with, with John, are you still right. doing the YouTube? I knew at one time you were doing some, some YouTube, um, yeah, how to, I, how to kind of videos. Yeah. I was doing YouTube videos on, until we sold the old house, moved into the apartment, COVID and all that. And I haven't really fired it up again here. Uh, so it's probably been two years since I've done one, but I, I want to start doing that again. It's essentially inside the publishing industry, answering the questions that that I get off the street about how does this work? You know, how does a movie deal work? How does right. you know, that, that kind of stuff? Yeah. But no, but please do visit the website. And uh, on there, you'll also see if you have book clubs or you have, uh, groups that want to talk about the books, you can on the, the book clubs and speaking and looking at the the thing there. Um, I do Zoom kinds of things all the time. So if you want to just chat about books, we can schedule something and do that. Is uh, did I click on it right there? Did it change? Yeah, there it is. Virtual book club visits. Okay. Yeah. And do you travel the country? with your, your book releases? Do you go to the big stores and do the book signings and, and all that? Not anymore. You know, COVID killed it. And, really? Uh, they didn't bring it back. And, and, well, it's, it's come back, but I've sort of lost my interest in it. Uh, it pay, traveling is such a pain in the ass. Sure. Um, so I do local book signings. They do conferences. Yeah. You know, there's thriller fest and voucher con. There are certain large scale, uh, events that every writer in the world goes to yeah. and and I'll go to those and there's some special things too. I mean, I'll be a keynote speaker here and there, but I don't, I don't do the, so get what up a, early, catch a flight, go to the bookstore, get back to the airport. What are you doing anymore. now to push and promote your books? I mean, you're, you're obviously getting on podcast and, and doing that is, is there like a virtual thing that you guys, that the publishers have put together now for, for authors to, to meet with their fans about the new book releases and things like that? How are they, are they gathering your masses? Um, I don't, I don't gather a lot of masses anymore. You know, there's local bookstores here. Yeah. Um, where I do signings and, uh, but otherwise there's, I don't think people are going to those anymore. Yeah. Um, I've never been to one. I mean, personally, I've never been to one, but I just, I didn't know. Cause that was like the big thing. When a book comes out, you know, I'm going to be at this bookstore. I'm going to be at this book. Come, you know, right. blah, blah, blah. That's how they pushed and promoted. I was just curious as to how maybe the, the publishers are are promoting their their author's books nowadays. Those are have always been driven by the bookstores, not oh. by the publisher. Okay. And Barnes & Noble is, as I understand it, um, I don't have inside knowledge on this, but Barnes & Noble is in trouble financially. They're closing stores, not opening new ones. Oh, damn. Um and you know the smaller bookstores can't can't handle the price, so uh, it, it's got, and then this you know the Zoom thing has has taken over. The problem with this in that kind of an environment here, it's you and I talking, and yeah. that's and that's great. If it's a conference where either it's it's one camera in the room, or which will be muted, or you got 
you know, two dozen people from their own homes and they're all muted. It's, there's no interaction with the audience. Yeah. It's really hard to do. Yeah. Well, I could do live on this and we could, you know, we could have a live audience and we could do like, I mean, they wouldn't be on, but I guess I might be able to like put them on to, but they could like type questions in as we're doing live and you could do it, you know. Ver- yeah, but you don't hear them laugh at the joke. Right. Exactly. Or yeah, you don't you know if the joke that. worked. Exactly. Yeah. You, you you lose that personal. Yeah. That personal interaction. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. I was just curious. I didn't know how the publishing industry would, uh, and if they were getting back to that or if the COVID, because a lot of people restructured how they do their business, you know, because virtual was just so convenient. It's cheaper. You can get more done, you know, mm-hmm. meet with more people. But I think way. what we lose through all of that. Exactly what we were talking about a earlier. Time since I've had a, a, a big boy job. You know, it's been, that's been a long time. But <laughs> when I did, I, most of the best ideas came from passing somebody's office and say, oh, we have, I was just thinking about that thing we talked about. And have you considered, and you have that, that spontaneous discussion that's not going to trigger an email. Nobody's going to have that random thought and then you get the email exchange or make a phone call. I think we're losing that. Yeah, uh, it's, definitely. It's the, it's the one-on-one personal in-person intimacy that we're losing, not only for our personal lives, but also, you know, it translates to the business world as well. You know, right. I, I think all that. And I just, I, I didn't know how maybe the publishing company might be, trying to overcome it doesn't sound I think like they they're are still trying to find they're still trying to find their way and the there's so much competition for books now and um uh, the you know we got to overcome uh podcasts and blog posts and news sites and gaming and netflix uh there's yeah there's so many things that people can do instead of read books now and i think the publishing houses are all trying to find their path yeah. through that. Well, it's like you said too, a lot of people are going to the audio versions of those too mm-hmm. instead of instead of the actual touch and feel and read kind of deal. So, so I just feel blessed that I'm able to do this still. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm I'm glad that you were doing it. I'm glad that you're still cranking out the the awesome content with Jonathan Grave and um, now with the new Irene, what's Irene's last name? Irene Rivers. Irene FBI Rivers. Director. Not not related to Joan. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm not sure. I don't know where that the last name came from. I know that Irene was my my mother-in-law, whom I never met. She passed away before I, I met my wife. Oh. So I was sort of in homage to her. Nice. I think it was a throwaway character at the beginning. I don't know where I came up with Rivers, but somewhere. Just came, yeah. just came. You probably, you were probably by a river. Yeah, and, uh, you're like, yeah. and I like the rhythm of it. Irene River sounds good. Yeah, it's got a good flow. Yeah, yeah. Ha ha, flow. I heard. I saw what you did there. See, <laughs> <laughs> that's why you're a professional. Right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but again, thank you so much, John, for taking the time to be on. And uh, I'm, I'm very embarrassed that I didn't record the first half. But it was just us doing the jack wagon anyway. So that's right. Uh, that was a big jack wagon too. A lot of people fast forward past my jack wagons anyway because they <laughs> they don't want to hear me ranting. So, uh, but if you're watching the video, you can go back and uh, either I put it in the beginning of the video or you can go to the podcast and and listen to the the first half of that. Um, but definitely go visit www.johngillstrap.com. He's on the grams. Do you do a lot of interaction on the grams, on the Instagram, social media? I, I don't. I'm I am a Facebook guy more than which is okay. uh, John Gilstrap author is my my Facebook page. Okay. Instagram, as I understand, is driven mostly by photographs, and I just don't take that many photographs. Yeah, they they've got so many different algorithms and they change up the algorithm so much. Is just I'm on there, I interact with my my listeners. That's where I do hey, this is who's coming up, post your questions kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Sometimes they'll go out to to everybody, and then sometimes they won't go out to to anybody. So um, you just constantly have to be watching our social media leadheads um, to see what's going on, what's new, our giveaways. We're giving away four guns this year on the AK Corner. Uh, and the this month's AK Corner, we're going to give you details on uh, the first giveaway that we're going to do this year. 
Every third episode, is it third? Every fourth episode, we're going to give a gun away on the AK Corner. Um, so listen to this month, which is be dropping the 15th, and we'll have details on what you have to do to participate to be able to win. We don't just give stuff away at random, John. They have to they have to actually earn earn it for our, for our giveaways. They have to participate, listen, and that's how they win here on the Talking Lead Podcast. All right. And you're eligible too. So you want to start listening to the AK Corner? Jump in there. Uh, we're going to give away some custom AKs and a PPS 43, you know, from World War II. Okay. Um, we might even give away a PM 63, one of those PM 63 pistols, which I'll show you. Remind me before we, we get off, I'll show you uh, what that is. Um, you'll really dig it. <laughs> okay. But uh, go and support all our sponsors Mission First Tactical. Use code LEADHEAD, get 20% off. Seal1, one, seal1.com, LEADHEAD, 25% off. Whiskey River Beef, Talking Lead 10, get 10% off at Whiskey River Beef. Um, where's the other one now? Keltec, you go to Keltec, use the code LEADHEAD, get 15% off. They came out with a new gen on their Sub 2000. I don't know if you stopped by their their booth to check out the new Sub 2000. Mm-mm. But it's uh it's got a twisty front now to where it it you don't have to worry about your optic and the discount doesn't work on firearms, so don't get all excited, lead heads there. But it works on any of their stuff in their pro shop, their hats, their accessories for their firearms, magazines, you know, things like that. Uh it still works fifteen percent off. And then uh Kraken cases. I usually say Kraken, then they get on my ass for saying Kraken. It's Kraken. Case, cases. You go to KrakenCases.com. Use the code TALKINGLED, and he's upped it to 15%. You get 15% off any of their cases. I don't know if we talked about their cases or not last time you were on. I don't think they were out yet, John. But they've come out with this, this foam that they put in their cases and they've got anywhere from this size all the way up to a, a rifle, like a double rifle case. Mm -hmm. Actually, it's a quadruple rifle case, but it's got this foam in there. Instead of like having the cutouts that to, to put your, your guns and stuff in, they've got this foam and it's cut resistant. It's heat resistant. It, it goes back to its original, original shape. Uh, on this particular case right here, I've put like three eggs in there, and I've tossed it and and opened it, and the it didn't crack the the egg. So I put my eye pro, I put my optics and things in this mm-hmm. size this size case. Um, very nice cases, guys. Go check them out. They've got different color cases available now, um, and he's working on a, a new project. So we'll talk about that coming up. So crackingcases.com, talking lead. 15% off. And then you're an explosives guy. I wanted to, to tell you about Firebird Targets. Are you familiar with Firebird Targets? I am not. So it's a non-binary explosive target. So it's about, you know, they're about that big around. And they're not, okay. much, not much thicker than, than my finger. But they give you a nice big explosion. So you could put them on a metal target. You could put it on wood. Or it needs a backer to to be able to get the the explosion. Okay. But it's a non-binary, and you don't have to have a certain velocity bullet, you know, like you do with Tannerite. Or, so you could shoot it with a bow and arrow, and it would, you know, you could set it off. This sounds scary to me. Uh, okay. Non-binary, that means there's, where's where's the safe arm device? Or if you drop this thing, does it go off? No, no. It, it, takes, okay. it takes a little harder hit than that. You it don't want to hit it with a hammer. Hit. You definitely don't want to hit it with a hammer. You don't want to staple it <laughs> to your <laughs> with your staple gun to your target. You know they've got other warnings in place for idiots um, like that, but they're very fun targets. Very simple, very easy to use. They've got a little sticky side. You can post it, you know, put it up. I shot some this weekend, and they've come out with one now that's that's a quieter explosion, so it's not as loud. Well, what's the point? Well, that's what I said, but they said they've, they've had several requests that if they had acquired a target, then they would be able to use it at their range or, you know, okay. or, or whatever. So uh, I think it's like 25 decibels or, or less um, that they've come out with. Brand new. They, they 
um, unveiled it. Actually, they unveiled it here on the show, and then they unveiled it at a shot show. But uh, I'll 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 get you some. I'll have you. Can you have those in? I think you can have them in West Virginia. Yeah. 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 I'll I'll get so, Ton to send you some of those. You'll. That would be great. You will like those. Yeah. <laughs> I bet I will. You'll you'll get some Firebird targets. Uh, but use the code Talking Lead fifteen, and you get fifteen percent off um, any of their targets there at Firebird Targets. So, there you go. Go support those. Support this show. That's how we're able to bring it to you each and every week, sometimes more often than that. And go and show our, our guest love. Go show, show John some love. Get his book. Go to Amazon. Go to his website. If you like the audio, the, the audio's out. Get the audio. If you like me, you like the old touch and feel. I like it more for display. Uh, I'll listen to mm-hmm. the audio, but I'll get the, the hardcover. And I like to have, you know, my you can't see it, but my bookcase is covered up by that. But I've got all my books there, and I've got another a place in the uh, other room over there. Where I've got books, um, but they might, you know, it's art. It's it's like art. Well, you know, the uh, on like Amazon, art. the 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 technology with um, their Kindle books. The, uh-huh. If if you buy the the Kindle, the book for Kindle for whatever it costs, I don't know, ten bucks for an extra couple of bucks, you can get the audio book too, and they talk to each other. So that if you're driving down the road and you're listening to the book and then you stop and then when you come home, you want to read in bed, the Kindle will be right where it'll pick you left up. off oh, in okay. the audio, which is... I have never done a Kindle. No, I'm not, I'm not that... I like paper. Yeah, if I'm going to read, it's going to be... I'm going to have the turn the page kind of thing, lick the finger, <laughs> put the glasses on, you know, kind of thing. So... Um, but again, John, any anything uh, you got the new one coming out in August? Uh, talk about that real quick. Oh, uh, that's going to be uh, zero sum is the name of that, yes. and um, just signed a contract for two more graves and for two more of the new Irene River series on awesome. employee for the next three years. Congratulations! And, uh, and I really appreciate the opportunity, Lefty, come on your show and to um, and not and not just hawk books, but also just to, to talk about stuff. Is stuff. Um, that's it's, what we like to talk I about. I really enjoy the opportunity. And I'll tell you, folks, the, uh, your audience, John at johngillstrap.com is my address, my email address. If you have questions or uh, if you want to, want to read the book and tell me what you think or take me to task for something, I do answer every email. And I'm almost always polite. Yeah. Or maybe he got a gun detail wrong or something like that. Or maybe oh, he nailed. Lordy, I'm, I know I'll hear from that. All right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> probably, probably more from that than anything else. Uh. Yes. <laughs> I love it, but I can't wait. I mean, hopefully somebody's going to take this to to the boob tube one day, and we we'll get to so. see Jonathan on the big screen. I would love to see who they who they pick for that, um, and hopefully you'll have a say so. And, and get, I won't. Get to, but I won't. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, until the next episode, Leadheads, again, go show John some love. Go show all our our sponsors love. And I want to hear from you on the social media. Uh, PM me, share our posts. That's how we get past these nasty old algorithms that are out there. And we get to the masses. Um, but keep your loved ones close. And your firearms closer. There you go. And make sure you go pick up the new edition of Jonathan Gray, Harm's Way. And Victoria Emerson, White Smoke.